Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of Scholars Portal Days. Um, my name is Sabina, and um, once again, I will be your host for, for this event. So I'm just going to start with a few housekeeping notes um, before we begin. First of all, this session is being recorded, and the recording and the slides will be shared afterwards. Um, in fact, uh, the slides for today's session, for most of today's sessions at least, are already available for you to download from Spot Docs um, if you would like to follow along with the slides. We also have live captioning available, um, so you can use the CC button in Zoom for that. Um, we do ask that you please keep your mic and your camera off uh, unless you are speaking or presenting. If you keep your mic on, we may forcibly mute, mute you in order to maintain our audio quality. If you have questions, um, you can use the chat um, or during a Q&A session, you can put your hand up and wait to be acknowledged. Um, you can also use the chat to um, talk with others. If you would like to show appreciation for uh, any speakers, uh, maybe some applause or a heart or a smiley face, you can do that using the reactions function within Zoom uh, to react with the uh, emoji that feels most appropriate. Uh, we also have a Twitter hashtag uh, that you can use um, if you would like to um, talk about what we're talking about today on Twitter, and that is hashtag SPDay22. So before we go further, we do want to um, acknowledge the land that we are on, and we recognize that there's people joining us from a, a large geographic region today, um, not just Ontario, um, pretty much everywhere in Canada. Um, so we do want to encourage you to reflect on the land you're joining us from today. And if you would like to, you can also add your own land acknowledgement um, into the chat at this time. But um, I want to acknowledge, uh, and we want to acknowledge the land on which Scholars Portal operates and upon which most Scholars Portal staff live and work. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle mm -hmm. Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and to work on this land. So um, once again, there's a resource on that slide, and I see my colleague Mohana dropped it into the chat as well, um, and uh, a few people adding their land acknowledgements as well. So you can feel free to continue to do that as I continue to speak. So yesterday we talked about uh, content, uh, sorry, we're talking about that today. Yesterday we ha had an amazing uh, keynote speech from uh, Leslie Weir talking a bit, little bit about the origins of Scholars Portal and kind of where it came from. Uh, we talked, we had a, an update from Ocal and we also talked about some of our client services and then we wrapped up the day with a uh, presentation in French. And so the recordings of that will be available early next week. Today we are starting with a Scholars Portal update uh, then we're talking about uh, our content services at Scholars Portal, followed by some lightning talks from Ocal Groups. Uh, then we have a break and our pet parade, <clears throat> which is a will be a narrated slideshow of pictures of pets, so you can stick around for that. Um, after the break, we will have a session on our preservation and storage services, and then on our data services, and then we'll wrap up for the day. And I just wanted to acknowledge before we move on to our next slide, um, our theme this year is currents of change. So the, the currents that are kind of pushing and pulling us in different directions. And um, because of that, our slide background this year is uh, inspired by tide maps. So it's got the kind of um, look of, of a, and feel of a, of a tide, tide map um, in, in water to kind of um, bring that uh, theme around full circle. So I'm going to pass it over now to Amy Greenberg uh, to start with the Scholars Portal update. Thank you, Sabina. Um, yes, there we go. <laughs> I will share my screen. The moment of truth in Zoom. All right. Let's do side to view. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have a, a, a very brief Scholars Portal update for you today. Um, oh, I guess I should say, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Amy Greenberg. I am the interim 
uh, Associate Director of the Scholars Portal. And with me today also, of course, is Kate Davis, who is the Interim Director of Scholars Portal. I'm going to be doing most of the most of the talking, but Kate um, is around and I'm sure she will let me know if I miss anything or if she has um, things to add. Uh, and she will, of course, be around for the for the Q&A. Um, so we have a, a brief update for you today, uh, kind of riffing on that currents of change theme. Um, and as you may have noticed, if you've perused the agenda or if you, you know, just what Sabina was mentioning earlier, um, we've kind of scattered the specific scholars portal updates that relate to particular services throughout the two days. So this is just going to be kind of a high level um, update. Uh, and we thought also that we could take the opportunity to reflect a little bit on the past 20 years and what the future might bring. So our topics look like this. Um, we're gonna do some reflection and, and consideration of the past and how those currents of change from the past might impact the future. Um, we of course have to do a staffing update. Um, the currents of change leave, <laughs> leave no one uh, behind and staffing is no exception. Um, and then we'd just like to talk for a couple minutes about um, an area that we've called in our annual report, which will be available to read soon, um, the building bridges. So those are just kind of about these overarching connections and the collaborative work that happens um, within Scholars Portal. And we just have a few examples to share with you there. So uh, let's get started. Um, this is a slide that may look a little familiar to you. It's a timeline with the years at the bottom and all of our services presented in chronological order um, in a horizontal bar, bar graph kind of way. And um, this, is, this is a way that we've typically thought about our services. Uh, we kind of divide them very roughly. The lines are blurry, but um, you know, we divide them roughly into content or data services that are shown on the slide with a pink background. And what we think of more as front-facing um, user services, whether those users are like end users at the schools or librarians or library staff at the schools, and those are color-coded uh, blue. So um, this is just kind of a snapshot of, of, of where we are now. Um, I'd like to go through the next few slides are just going to go through some of that history in a little more detail and also showing services that we no longer provide just to, um, you know, to give you a sense of how things have have kind of um, ebbed and flowed to use the currents of change uh, metaphor, hopefully not to belabor it too much. So um, as those of you who heard Leslie Weir's talk uh, yesterday. Um, and as those of you who have been um, within OCA libraries for a while know or may remember, uh, in the beginning of Scholars Portal, there was journals. 2002, a uh, locally loaded journals platform. It wasn't called Scholars Portal Journals, but it quickly became, became that. Um, still going strong uh, with a few exciting uh, new developments in store that we will uh, talk about a little, bit, uh, a little bit later and more to come that you'll hear uh, later in the day as well. Journals was followed pretty quickly by a few um, related, I would say, um, user facing services. Um, so journals was 2002. In 2003, uh, we launched Racer, shared ILL system, still going strong today. Um, and around the same time, not long after Racer, we launched SFX, that open linking service. Um, and not long after that, we launched RefWorks, citation management service. Um, and again, um, kind of, tying it back to Leslie's talk yesterday, um, those things were all seen as ways of sort of taking this journal's content that was now being made available online and creating all sorts of connections. So um, Racer as a way of helping um, scholars within Ontario request items, find and request items more quickly. Um, SFX as a way of facilitating that connection between a citation and the full text of, of, of the journal article and Refworks as a way of, of managing these citations in an online, in an online way. Um, between the period of 2006 and 2009, we added uh, Illumina, Verde and Odyssey raise your hand if you remember Illumina and Verde. Verde especially, as you can see, was, um, was uh, you know, fairly short-lived as Scholars Portal, as Scholars Portal services go. Um, Illumina was the um, kind of multi-integrated uh, uh, search platform that we had for a little while. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so it's interesting that of all of those, um, Odyssey is, is the one that uh, survives to this day. Uh, jumping ahead, um, in 2009, 2010, we had the addition of quite a few new services. We had um, 
Wizfolio as a sort of alternate citation management um, service that we were exploring, um, and Scott, the serials collection overlap tool, both of those had about the same, the same um, uh, lifespan, as you can see, starting in around 2010 and ending in around 2014. Um, and we had books, books launched as a service around that time too. And that one is still, you know, is still going strong as well. Raise your hand if you remember Scott or Wizfolio. I should say Wizfolio may still exist. We just don't, uh, as RefWorks does, they're just not Scholars Portal uh, supported services anymore. Um, all right, jumping ahead in time, um, just by one year. So in 2011, um, by then, Verde and Illumina uh, had uh, ceased to exist as Scholars Portal services. Um, but instead, we added um, Ask a Librarian, our shared chat service, um, and our the Ocal Usage Rights um, uh, platform, I guess you could, uh, you could say. Uh, just adding things now to the slide, it's starting to get very crowded on here. So if we jump ahead further to 2012, 2013, we added uh, a few very significant services, uh, the GeoPortal and Dataverse, um, and not long afterwards, ACE, the Accessible Content ePortal. So things are very busy at this point, as you can see just from the number of services, I think we have 12. I should have, I should have counted them before, but anyway, yeah, lots going on. Um, Lots going on during this time. Uh, 2014, moving ahead in one year, equally busy. Um, however, we said we said farewell to Wizfolio and Scott at this time, but we said hello to um, hosting OJS and OMP, Open Journal Systems, Open Monograph Press, those PKP services that enable um, libraries <clears throat> and institutions to self-publish and 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 self-host um, through the use of of uh, an open open source software um, and and in 2015 uh, we started providing that as a service on behalf of local schools um, the other thing we said hello to at that time was the french language pilot of our ask the librarian service so uh which is called clavel day um, and that launched at the same time as well so if we skip ahead a few years to 2015, 2018, that kind of brings us to where we are today with the addition of OLRC, the Ontario Library Research Cloud and Permafrost as our newest um, officially launched service um, and the sunsetting of SFX. So SFX is now no longer on the slide. So this is again, kind of traditionally how we've um, thought about and, and explored the kind of timeline and progression of our services. But um, you know, there's more to the story than services being added or sunsetted, uh, depending on the needs of, of libraries. And one thing that we've noticed, and that has become more, more apparent and is, I think, appropriate to the theme of the day, is that a growing component of our services is the fact that we provide those services beyond the kind of strict confines of OCL. So another way that we can um, that we can think about this is. Um, this and this is just the same list of services that was on the previous slide, um, with some of them now highlighted in white as a service that's offered beyond Ogle. And I'm going to go through them. So starting from the top, um, or, or I guess starting from oldest to newest, um, we have books. Um, so the books platform um, provides access to many institutions beyond Ogle um, to specific publisher collections. Most notably, of course, is the ACUP collection, the Canadian University Press titles, um, which through an agreement with eBound and CRKN, um, we provide access uh, to the full text for that. So that is definitely um, an aspect of the service that spans across Canada, and we have agreements with those schools um, uh, that they, you know, access those books on our platform. So that's probably one that's kind of more in the more in the limelight, I guess I would say. Um, in a similar vein, though, um, not long after Odyssey launched, um, we also offered. Um, some of those licensed collections beyond uh, OCL as well. So there are many Canadian institutions um, who subscribe to Odyssey um, and access their licensed data collections that way, as well as the DLI um, data, the Data Liberation Initiative. Um, and you'll hear more about, um, about Odyssey uh, later today. Um, skipping down a few services, um, the Hour service. So that's an, that's an interesting one because Hour is really a way of um, kind of taking license usage information and displaying it for end users. Um, and of course, because um, the, the content that Ogle provides for its users 
uh, is not only licensed just within OCL. In many cases, OCL partners up with other consortia or other institutions, most notably at the Canadian level at CRKN. Um, so because we are part of so many shared license agreements, it makes sense that um, if we have this tool to help take those license agreements and put them in usable form, this is something that could benefit um, a lot of other institutions who share those same licenses. So that kind of always made sense as a shared service. And again, it's something that um, a lot of Canadian institutions um, uh, take, take part in as well. Um, ACE is a really interesting one that uh, fairly recently, I would say, just comparatively speaking, um, we entered into an agreement with the Ontario College, College Library Service. So it's not just the universities now, but Ontario colleges as well, who can provide access to accessible content for their users and can also add um, some of those accessible content texts um, to the platform. <clears throat> so that's been a great collaboration so far. <clears throat> Sorry, allergies. And last but not least, and again, something that you'll hear about um, a little later today with OLRC, and this is our newest service that now has um, uh, that now has subscribers outside of OCL. Uh, we have two, um, St. Francis Xavier and Concordia, and I'm not sure if we have any colleagues from those institutions here with us today, but if so, welcome. Um, so yes, after a lot of work with SPOD and with the OLRC group at Scholars Portal, um, we figured out a better, uh, pricing model and one that was more attractive to folks outside of OCL and that also um, lowered costs for the folks within OCL. And we were in a position to offer that as a service um, externally. And so, uh, and, and so it is. Um, so last but not least on this slide um, is of course Dataverse. So Dataverse gets a special red background because uh, unlike our other services where we have um, kind of uh, subscription agreements, I guess you could say, with these non ocal institutions, Dataverse is, as hopefully you all are aware now, um, an actual national service. So this is not something that's provided um, exclusively by OCL, but rather it's provided by OCL and by COPAL and CAL and all of our um, all of our uh, fellow academic consortia across Canada and is managed at that national level right now. So that is a pretty um, that's a pretty exciting uh, development, I would say. And and taking that as a model, I'm kind of thinking about how um, some of our other services might evolve. So this slide just sort of shows what we what we think um, you know the future might look like. Um, so not again, kind of expanding beyond a subscription model into a model where there are some services or aspects of services that are actually managed at this national level. Um, so in in addition to Dataverse, um, there uh, it looks like journals or part of journals might be headed that way, and specifically the trusted digital repository aspect. So we've been having conversations with CRKN. Uh, which is the Canadian Resource Knowledge Network, I neglected to mention that before, sorry, um, about bringing that TDR service um, also to the national level. So that's really exciting and uh, stay tuned for more info about that. Um, and, and again with Odyssey. So as I said, right now we kind of have a subscription model for Odyssey, but um, as you'll hear later, um, due to some uh, necessary changes in the back end of the Nestar software, for Odyssey, we are now looking at migrating that content over to Dataverse, which, as we've said, is already a national service. So we're having lots of conversations. Um, you know, what does that mean then for Odyssey as a service? Is it likely that it too will kind of move on to this national national level? So a lot of conversations to be had um, to be had there. And um, we've been talking a lot with the Scholars Portal Operations and Development Committee SPOD about you know what further conversations and, and actions need to happen. And again. You will um, you'll hear more about that later. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour through our services. Um, I'm probably running ahead of or uh, not ahead of schedule, <laughs> um, taking uh, taking over you know too much time. But I, I feel like that is a tradition at Scholar Portal Day, and who am I to break with tradition? So we have to go over our time. I don't make the rules. Um, okay, moving ahead to other. To other aspects of the currents of change. As I mentioned, lots going on with staffing. Um, we were very fortunate to recently welcome uh, a few new folks to our team. Uh, welcome everyone. We have Naranjan, Yuri, Jessica, and Alicia. And uh, we also were very happy to welcome back um, Megan and Jacqueline, who had been on leave, came back partway through the last year. We're so happy to have them back with us. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this uh, 
the new folks came on because we had to say farewell to quite a few people on the team, um, Alicia, Amaz, Andy, Kara, and Katya. Um, fortunately for us, those folks are all um, currently at Oakville institutions, so they haven't gone too far, but, uh, but we, do miss, um, we do miss working with them on a regular basis. So the currents of change, hard at work uh, within our team. Uh, lastly, just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about this, this concept of building bridges. Um, if I may further stretch the metaphor, uh, you know, no service at Scholars Portal is an island. Um, we have many bridges that hold us together, both, both within the team, I would say, um, and of course, uh, outside the team. And we've talked a little bit about that with all of our connections to external, external um, partners as well. Um, I really cannot have a scholars portal update without acknowledging the amazing work of our systems team. Um, shout out to the systems team. They, they kind of do everything. Their tasks are never ending. Um, as I'm sure those of you who work in systems and with systems are aware, continuous monitoring, got to make sure everything is not only up and running and functional, but that security up to date that updates to hardware and software are happening. And, um, you know, it's just, it's the foundation of, of everything that we do, uh, basically. And so um, in particular, I, I'll say, you know, we had a few kind of major um, upgrades and infrastructure improvements last year, including migration to Chef, which allows the team to more quickly spin up virtual servers, um, increases reliability. Um, there was uh, there were also some hardware um, hardware upgrades of the virtual machines that were done over the past year, uh, <laughs> and on that security on that security team uh, or security note rather uh, there were patches uh, that sort of semi emergency patches I would say some of you may be aware of this too that had to happen for Samba and Log4j there were some security vulnerabilities that were identified um, and needed to be worked on and those were accomplished with minimal impact on our on our uptime which is always great um, and most recently we have um, we have uh, brought on um, multi-factor authentication for our kind of um, front not front facing but services where we have public access that are not IP restricted um, and that includes things like nextcloud um, and the internal um, software called mattermost that we use for messaging so Lots going on as always, and thank you to our systems team. Um, the other team, smaller than systems, it's basically Bart and Caitlin, with help from others, but our small but mighty web services team, uh, also responsible for pretty much anything to do with any um, web interface <laughs> that, that you see, um, including but not limited to our static web pages that we have for many of our services and our scholars portal. Um, our Scholars Portal uh, website and, and many more. They, of course, are also responsible um, for, for the OJS hosting that we do. And they accomplished, um, you know, they accomplished um, uh, a new server set up uh, at the time that, that the latest upgrade was done for OJS. For OJS and that was done, um, uh, again, very like quickly with minimal um, and, you know, hardly any any downtime. And I know that was appreciated by um, by all the folks who we host for. Um, Bart and Caitlin also are continually in discussions with OCL, um, uh, uh members at OCL staff, staff at OCL member libraries to uh, monitor and and um, improve accessibility. Uh, issues. They've put a lot of thought and a lot of and a lot of work into that. And again, that is just a continuous job. And um, kudos to them for keeping us all on track there. Um, and another thing that they they accomplished recently was just providing an improved user experience for folks who are coming to um, our services from outside the IP range of their institution. Uh, this, of course, is something that happened a lot over COVID, and um, they have. Uh, they've improved that user experience in terms of what happens and how people are redirected. So thank you to the web services team. Okay, last but not least, I just wanted to talk about collaborations. Um, we've done a lot of work over communicate with communications over the past year in collaboration, mainly with the OCLSP committee. So thank you OCLSP for all your input and, um, and help with this. Um, notably, as uh, are indicated there on the slide, we launched our tri-annual newsletter in September of 2021. And you can find um, the past uh, issues of that on our LEARN website. Um, and the other uh, communications initiative we launched was the Learn with SP webinar series. It's been really well received. Uh, we've had a lot of views 
topics so far have included digital preservation, web accessibility, usage stats, and web analytics, and linked data. And you can find the recordings and slides also on our Learn website. And I believe uh, Mohana is putting the links to those in the chat, but they are also available on the slide. Um, so these are all um, initiatives that we, as I said, we've done in collaboration with OCLSP. And thank you to everyone on the team who's, who's worked on those. Um, primarily, uh, I know Sabina and Caitlin especially have put in a lot of, um, a lot of work. So thank you. Very last, I promise this is the last slide. Um, another example of collaboration, and this is something that Michael Vandenberg mentioned yesterday in his OCL executive uh, director update, and that's the shared repository infrastructure working group. So as mentioned yesterday, um, with the support of SPOD and the OCL SP committee, um, some of our staff on our team, together with OCL library staff, are moving forward with investigating the feasibility of a shared um, a shared infrastructure um, for institutional repositories um, across OCL. And um, this is something that's come up at various times. I know it's something that we've heard in, in discussions with, um, with you folks over the last little while. There was a recent renewal of interest which culminated in the formation of this working group. They have a very, um, a uh, very short time frame to get things done, about six months. They are going to be answering five kind of high level questions about what a shared IR is, what it would look like, what the needs are. Um, we have three very capable co-chairs on that group, so I'm sure that that work will get done. And um, of course, part of the kind of time pressure around this is just the fact that there's lots of work and lots of thinking going on about this topic, uh, most notably at the CARL level for a national shared repository infrastructure. So what we really want to try to do is take advantage of those conversations and ensure there's minimal duplication of effort in all of our thinking about this and really try to use our local time to um, to uh, distill what's what's coming from these other conversations and think about what that might look like in the local uh, in the local context. So that's really exciting work, and I'm sure we will hear more from this group over the next little while, and specifically in about six months. Okay, that is all. Thank you so much for your attention. I apologize for setting our agenda all uh, in a in a fuss, but uh, hopefully. Hopefully you found it interesting and I am very happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people. All right, thanks so much, Amy. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna get the next presentation set up just in the interest of time, but if anything rolls in there, um, I'm happy to get that going too. Great, and I'll be around for the whole day if people have, or the whole day, the whole three hours. And uh, I'm sure Kate will be as well. You're welcome, Catherine. And thank you for the shout out for the SP Learn with SP webinar series. I think that's been really, it's been really amazing to be able to share some of the great expertise on our, on our team um, with you folks. Okay. How's that looking? I can see it. No, I don't want that. I want that. How's that? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacqueline White Appleby, and I'm the uh, scholarly resources librarian here at Scholars Portal. And I'm delighted to be moderating the content services section this morning. Um, so this section is presentations looking at work happening around electronic books and journals, and around um, specifically improving the usage usage experience and improving the research process for our users. So we have three short presentations, and then um, I have a couple of quick updates that I'll try to keep extra quick. Um, I'm gonna introduce each presenter as they come. Feel free to pop questions in the chat at any time, but uh, we'll probably, we'll, we'll see how, whether we wanna save them to the end or uh, uh, do them after each session, depending on how they go. All right, um, so first up, we have Marching Towards a PDF Pit Stop, Improving Scholars Portal Journals for Blind Users Across Ontario Along the Way. And I'm delighted to welcome from Wilfrid Laurier, uh, Ashley Shaw, who's an MA student in community psychology and the former library web accessibility advisor, Matt Weiler, who's the web and user experience librarian, and Matt Thomas, who's the e-resources librarian. And from New College at the University of Toronto, Annette Kwok is the Information Services and Instruction Librarian, and Scholars Portal's own Bark Vula, who's the Web and Discovery Services Librarian. So in the interest of keeping things 
um, going kind of quick. You know what? I might need to do this again. Just a sec. Sorry. I did not optimize for video. All right, here we go. Great. Good morning. Today, we'd like to talk to you about a design challenge we've embarked on over the past year to address the inaccessibility of PDF library materials for patrons who are blind. PDF as a format has produced a host of accessibility barriers for blind scholars. And in one study, only 2% of the PDFs for scientific papers published between 2010 and 2019 were found to meet accessibility criteria. When we evaluated 38 journal articles I needed for the literature review of my master's thesis, 31 were untagged, suggesting that no accessibility criteria were addressed during their creation. For library users who are blind, the accessibility of full text materials, including PDFs, is a major obstacle. Three. The creators of PDFs typically do not verify accessibility using a screen reader. The first people who experience the PDF with a screen reader are therefore often end users. In many PDFs, the layer of text accessible to screen readers is full of spelling errors, missing spaces between words, has no clear reading order, contains no descriptions for images, and lacks identifiable headings, links, tables, footnotes, references, and page numbers. Four. Last summer, we partnered with the CNIB's Summer Learning Academy, that's the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and we provided a library research workshop for blind and partially sighted high school students. We had a great deal of difficulty locating a fully accessible journal article for the students to find in a known item search. This reflects the difficulty students have during post-secondary education when attempting to obtain copies of reading and research materials in a timely manner. Five. It is difficult to remediate these accessibility issues in PDFs. And even if every publication was accessible going forward, there are an enormous number of existing PDFs that remain inaccessible. Recommendations for Ontario's 2021 post-secondary education standard indicate that PDFs pose accessibility problems for users with disabilities and need to be addressed. Six. Through dialogue, Ashley and I conceptualized the solution as a PDF pit stop baked into library systems. Seven. This slide shows a full record display of, from Scholars Portal Journal with a PDF pit stop link next to the PDF download link. When the user clicks the PDF pit stop link, the idea is that the article goes to a pit stop for remediation and then it's sent to the user as quickly as possible. You could imagine this for Omni too. During this phase, we formed a design team. Matt Thomas, electronic resource librarian, but also temporary head of collections development and acquisitions at Laurier at the time. Bart Kavula, web and discovery services librarian at Scholars Portal and Annette Quack from the DGIB library at New College and an expert in PDF remediation workflows. Eight. There are some key features of a PDF pit stop. If your library gives a document to the user that has not been verified with a screen reader, then you do not have a PDF pit stop. There are things we can do proactively before documents are handed over. If your patron is expected to do more work than your sighted patrons to get a usable resource, then you do not have a PDF pit stop. The goal is for equitable access. And if problems aren't reported to stakeholders, such as publishers, authors, those in charge of acquisitions and negotiations, or liaison librarians, then you do not have a PDF pit stop. Making all of these people aware of problems drives system level improvements. Nine. While working on examples provided by Ashley for her graduate studies, we explored tools, remediation, uh, remediators, automated workflows, notifying publishers, authors, and librarians, we even used Microsoft 365 to remediate a Word version of a dissertation in parallel. And while stepping through the pit stop workflows, I noticed that sometimes I could find HTML versions on Scholars Portal Journal. Uh, they were almost hidden. And while they had flaws like no page numbers or bad, or bad tables, but HTML is vastly easier to fix than PDF. Ten. Because of the discrepancies between the visual and the actual text in a PDF file, 
it's become obvious that HTML is the way to go in the remediation path. The graph on this slide shows the percentage of full text HTML availability for all Elsevier content in Scholars Portal. As you can see, it was below 10% in 2006, jumped to about 80% in 2008, and today it's about 95%. In response, we elevated the status of HTML so that it now loads on the page by default, like the image on the left shows. And attention has been paid to integrating it into the page so that all of the headings in the article are structured correctly. The image on the right shows the heading map of an article page. And in case you're not aware, headings like this are what allow assistive technologies to navigate around the page and are almost always missing in PDF files. The biggest advantage of PDF is that people can save it to their computers, which is why it still continues as the dominant format. Fortunately, EPUB solves this problem, which is essentially HTML wrapped into a zip file. So for all of our HTML content, we now offer an EPUB option for download. The image on the left shows the search results on the site with the EPUB download link beside the PDF link, and the image on the right shows the, right, the file displayed in an EPUB reader. Nevertheless, only 20% of our total collection has full text HTML, hence the need for a PDF remediation plan. The EPUB versions are also not perfectly accessible either. There are still issues with missing alt text for figures and missing page numbers, but remediating those are a lot easier than modifying a PDF file. 14. While this discovery and change is good news, it does not mean we are home free. We have millions of inaccessible articles. Just because something is available in HTML, it does not mean it was designed to be accessible. University libraries do not give sighted readers damaged journal articles, and we should not give blind readers damaged journal articles and, and expect them to seek repairs. According to the ACRL Information Literacy Standards, readers are expected to evaluate if the material is relevant to their study, not spend their limited time finding readable copies of material worrying if they're asking for too much or learning to cope without. 15. We continue towards the PDF pit stop goal as we respond to the obstacles in front of Ashley, as well as current incoming blind and partially sighted students, staff, administrators, faculty, and librarians. And you can help. Can you refer us to people who we can talk with? We are looking for experts in automated tools, such as SharePoint's Power Automate, experts in collaborative editing tools for HTML, and 16. speak out and speak up. As long as we have files in our collections that have not been verified as having the features print disabled readers need, then we need uh, pit stops in our library platforms. Library employees of Ontario universities can choose to make history, speak out and say, we want OCL to support PDF pit stops. Thank you. Thank you. Um, am I? Thank you so much. There were a lot of numbers in that, and uh, some of them were quite surprising and not in a good way. So thank you. I don't see anything coming into the chat. People are probably still formulating their thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Next up, we have about all that chat. And this is from Art Rhino, who is the systems librarian at the University of Windsor. And today he's gonna to be talking about Jupyter Notebooks for text analysis. Um, Art is the recent chair of the Alto board, which maintains the Alto standard for digitized text. I had to look this up. Alto is an XML schema for describing the physical layout and content of, for example, a newspaper. It was also the co-owner and publisher of the Essex Free Press for a decade. So you can see why he might be interested in that topic. And I think there's a nice, um, there may be some nice overlap in, in this session and the last one. Uh, so this session is also pre-recorded. It's a little bit quiet, so I would encourage you all to turn up your speakers if um, you find it that way. And I will remind you to turn them down before we go on to the next discussion. Um, all right, so here we go. Hi there. I'm going to talk about text. 
And I'm going to do that through what I'm calling two text trajectories, the Jupyter Notebooks. And I apologize at the outset for skipping through a lot of projects and initiatives that I'm going to point to more than explain. I'm hoping that you can go to the slides afterwards and follow the URLs if you are interested. The journey really begins just before the pandemic with this story from the University of Arizona News. At Arizona, they've done an incredible job of leveraging their newspaper digitization work for supporting data literacy. And the live guide link nicely brings together the results of these efforts, which I am largely going to skip over. The project, however, has received funding as part of a broader initiative called Collections as Data which is also well worth exploring. Basically the idea of using content, especially cultural heritage content for text analysis and other forms of data processing. Arizona is somewhat unique in embedding this work into the curriculum to the extent that they have done. I can't expound on this, but I did want to show the success they've had in integrating their digitization efforts into courses. And this is a list of the courses where Jupyter Notebooks are a conduit to text analysis and teaching. I lifted this quote directly from one of Arizona's slides. It reads, avoid installation woes and dependency hell for students. This is hard enough in person. And their solution has been Jupyter Notebooks. If you are not acquainted with Jupyter Notebooks, this example is following the script from Arizona. Jupyter is sort of a web-based computing environment. I'm looking at occurrences of the term influenza from mid-1917 to 1919, which is when the Spanish flu was rampant in Canada. The newspaper content comes from a local title called the Amherstburg Echo, which we digitize with the help of our digital world. You can basically put your coding in these cells on the notebook page and have them run interactively. And this chart shows about what we would expect. The term influenza goes from nothing to appearing a lot by mid-1918. I know not everyone is going to think coding statements in a cell, in this case, Python is, very intu is a very intuitive rendering of logic, but at least the building blocks are there for explaining what is going on. Notebooks also encourage sharing. Really, it is not so much notebooks, but the platform that they are on that can promote sharing. And some are better at this than others. But at least one promise of notebooks is that you can spend your own versions of what is available. And at least compared to most pathways to research computing, notebooks are an arguably smoother entry point to research caliber systems than many other options. The second text trajectory that I want to highlight is the CORD-19 Open Research Dataset, which first became available in March 2020. This received a lot of attention at the time. The White House and a coalition of leading research groups created a freely available data set of over 1 million scholarly articles to encourage data mining and other text-based approaches to help in the fight against COVID-19. I was fortunate to be able to work with Eric Lees Morgan on the CORD-19 data set as part of his ongoing efforts to leverage text tools to help manage information overload, a project he calls the Distant Reader. My role was mostly to help with indexing the CORD-19 data set, for which I use Solar and Lucene, but I learned three important lessons from the process. One lesson, and probably the most important one for this event, is that Scholar's Portal data is awesome. BART has been working on a data view of Scholar's Portal content that is world class, and I think positions Scholar's Portal well to leverage scholarly text for this kind of processing. Eric had incredible luck in getting support from leading edge research computing environments, and I was able to see and use some very impressive supercomputer systems in Indiana and Pittsburgh. I've seen a few others over the years as well, and they tend to be somewhat cryptic and insular. They have their own ways of exposing significant computing resources, and there tends to be a one-off learning curve with each one of them. So a promise of Jupiter for research computing is that it might be the basis of a more consistent approach to research environments in general. And finally, I don't want to oversell what is possible. The link here is a challenge that came from a consultation Aries Group had with a medical researcher at the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. And if you are interested in the edges of text analysis, it is, it is available for you to ponder. In terms of what is possible, I think it is worth considering the Kaggle competition that was held with the same data set. Kaggle has been called an Airbnb for data scientists. It's backed by Google. And it is the Jupyter's notebook environment that I think really delivers on the idea of being able to share solutions. If you are interested in what Jupyter can offer for analyzing scholarly text content, I would encourage you to look at this competition. 
So I'm going to highlight a particular workbook from the Kaggle competition. This workbook attempts to provide a more like this solution when identifying an article that is of value for a researcher. You can go to the link and walk through every cell and read the explanations. But I'm going to cut to the chase and execute all the cells at once. And given what I know about the underlying data set, I think the results are promising. I should note, however, that it took 11 minutes in real time to execute this notebook. Some of you probably already know about this, but there is a project involving Compute Canada that offers a Kaggle-like environment for universities in Canada, and I believe all OCL sites would have access to it. And it is called SysAG, which is a clever name that means the alignment of three or more celestial objects. And my understanding is that it's really just a matter of getting a form filled out by your computing center. We are still in that process at Windsor, but I'm hopeful we will get there soon. Jupiter seems to be a common thread now for research computing in Canada. I understand that there's a project at the University of Toronto as part of the 2I2C initiative, which I believe started at Berkeley. And of course, the Digital Alliance of Canada, which is a big part of whatever Compute Canada is now, seems to see Jupiter as a common entry point for accessing computing resources. So this has truly been a lightning talk. Bart and I have talked a bit about building a community of interest on text analysis vis-a-vis -vis the amazing work being done at Scholars Portal. And if you want to join in this process, Bart and I would be thrilled to hear from you. Thanks for listening. All right, if you turned your uh, volume up, now is your cue to turn it down a little bit. Hi there. Whoops. All right. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ravik David, who is the Distinctive Collections Librarian at Scholars Portal. Um, and she's going to give you some updates on the government and gray literature that we've been loading into Scholars Portal books. Many of you know that we've been expanding our government and related literature collections over the past few years. So it's a lot of content loading, but it's also a lot of metadata work. And uh, Ravik is going to walk you through what some of that has been. Hi, good morning. Okay. Ravid, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen, and it's all yours. Can you see my slides? Yes, looks good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure uh, to see all of you. I'm going to deliver a short update on the government information and gay, gray literature on Scholars Portal uh, ebook platform. And like everyone else, I'm happy to take uh, questions afterwards if you have any. So today I'm going to focus on um, three things. I'm going to talk about the think tank uh, metadata crowdsource project that uh, we're working on, new and upcoming collections in the GovInfo community, and a review of feedback group um, that's also part of the GovInfo community. So I'll start by our uh, OCL metadata crowdsourcing project, the Canadian Think Tank Collection, a, an amazing example in my mind to uh, an OCL collaboration. Um, as you probably know, policy documents uh, touch all aspects of our life, but the vast bulk of new reports, papers, and other items published by the world's policy, policy experts at international organization, non-governmental organization, and think tanks is self-published informally on the website of these organization. This makes them hard to find and put them at risk of being lost. It is also why UTL GovInfo librarians identified some needs, uh, identified, sorry, the needs to preserve content from significant Canadian think tank organizations and have crawled the website using Archivit. Identifying the significance of preserving and improving discoverability for this type of content, SP have worked with UTL to extract content from the think tank website and load it in, onto SP book platform. However, like most collections that don't come from, from the publishing world, the collection had no metadata. In July 2020, and in consultation with the OCL Executive Committee, uh, we sent a call for participation in the Think Tank Metadata Project. We asked for some experience working with metadata ca or cataloging, but 
Training materials, training sessions, and bi-weekly calls allowed everyone who joined to get to know the metadata schema we are using on books and get involved in the project. In the same way, our calls allowed everyone to also um, understand the new uh, metadata that they were dealing with, coming mostly from Mark and moving to the bit schema that we're using on Gov, uh, on books. Sorry. Uh, the minimum commitment was 100 records per person, but we also had um, folks who completed hundreds of records and are still completing them. Participants worked in their own time and specific um, records that uh, we found difficult or want to discuss in a group are, are brought to the community calls um, for, for a forum discussion. Uh, as campuses across Ontario started to open up and participant roles shifted again, some had to drop off uh, from the project while others remain. Currently, we have cataloged over 8,000 records and we are working with Ex Libris uh, ProQuest team to put the records in ALMA. Uh, we hope to complete the project in summer 2022. And lastly, we hope the collection will, be, will benefit the entire uh, OCO community. It is subscription free, obviously. We can update it anytime we want. And we know the metadata for this collection adheres to OCL high standards of description metadata. So win-win um, for all of us. This is basically the metadata, a screenshot of the metadata editor that uh, participants in this project working with. And we tweaked it to meet the specific uh, requirements of, of this particular project. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all the OCL members, uh, staff members who volunteered their time for this project. It was a pleasure to get to know you. And I learned a lot from the feedback you provided on the work, the training materials, and the metadata editor. We kept improving all three, the, the instructions, the metadata editor, um, and everything we worked with based on this uh, ongoing feedback. And finally, we're extremely happy that all of our call uh, members will be able to join the, to enjoy the fruits of this project. So thank you, thank you again, everyone who took uh, part in this project. It was amazing to work uh, with some of you and still amazing to, to keep working with you. Um, the next is new and upcoming collections. So the first list is collections we are working directly uh, in partnership with the uh, specific bodies like the Ontario Workplace Tribunal Library, the Ontario Legislative Library and the Ministry of Agriculture to get their collections based on requests from our GovInfo community. And the second list are digitization plan for the OCL um, GovInfo community and in order um, to digitize this content, which is mostly print-based, obviously, we will need to figure out metadata for most of those collection. Um, every work with GovInfo is invo involving a lot of metadata, either enrichment, cleanup, or even creation, as, in, in, as I showed in the Think Tank project. Uh, in all those cases, of course, we need to put a lot of uh, labor into making it um, at the standard we want, but um, I think it's worth it, especially if these collections are at risk. Um, again, metadata continues to be a challenge, and this is why uh, I'm going to move to the third part of my presentation, which is uh, which is going to talk a little bit about um, some feedback group um, that we have to to deal with some of the challenges we have in GovInfo uh, content. So over a decade now, the library resources allocated to the Ontario government has been in constant and rapid decline, as we know. Uh, it is no wonder then that librarians from the government um, learn to put their trust in universities to preserve government information. The lack of resources on the government side has created a situation where GovInfo collection come to SP books in all shapes and forms of metadata. Although SP eBook service allows flexibility in the form of the data, creating guidelines around what type of metadata is needed for GovInfo collections could save a lot of quality control tests and metadata enrichment hours for everyone involved. For this reason, in October 2020, Scholars Portel asked for some feedback on how best to present and arrange government information and related content on our eBook uh, platform. The call for participation went out to the GIS mailing list and other local forums. 
A small, a small group of Gov Info librarians from OCL and the Ontario government met regularly to discuss best metadata practices for Gov Info content. Since uh, SP eBook service uses BITS as its bibliographic um, metadata standard, the conversation focused mainly around that, but the participant also reviewed examples for MARC records and consulted with essential documents such as the Ontario metadata guidelines. The feedback group is currently finalizing its work by putting all the input into a final report and will be, uh, and hopefully it will be highly beneficial for future metadata creation for government publications, improving access and discoverability. We are grateful to all of our partners from the government of Ontario and their input on the unique challenges that metadata for government information may pose. Finally, I would like to take the opportunity and invite you to reach out to me if you have new ideas for collections that you would like to see, uh, to create and see on our ebook platform. And of course, I would be happy to meet with you and discuss further. So this is all uh, for me today, and I'm happy to take questions um, during the end. I will stop sharing. Great, thank you, Ravi. I'm going to load up the next slides, but folks, uh, feel free to put anything in the chat. And at this point, um, I'm just going to share a couple of quick updates about the journals platform. Any questions or comments you have about books and journal services generally, we welcome them now. All right. So very quickly, I just want to flag something that is new and live on the platform now. We receive retraction data, obviously, for our journals content, and we receive it from different publishers in very different ways. So a lot of work has been done recently to harmonize the way that that appears and to um, better build the connection between an original article and a retraction notice. Um, so here is an example of an article that has been retracted. Um, and in a future issue, you can see that this is a retraction of this article and this links back to it there. So that's something that's live now um, for, for use. And then the last thing that I wanted to share about is uh, a, an ongoing linked data project that uh, the journals team has been working on and specifically Wei and Jampi. Um, and this is uh, not live now. This is more of a, um, it's beyond proof of concept, but um, the idea is to use the data that's in Scholars Portal journals and the data that we get from ORCID to build a, a, a space um, for, for looking at the Canadian scholarship that's housed on the platform. So again, this is not sort of what the final link will look like. This is, this is, but the idea is that there is something called Focus on Canadian Scholarship that's available to you. And you can click through and view um, authors by their ORCID ID the institutions that they are employed by, educated by, and funded by. Um, and as you're browsing through this, you can select any author and then bring it back to the journals platform to see what they've written. So obviously there are a lot of possibilities about what we could, what we could do with this data, how we could use it. Um, I would say we're still in uh, not the, the early, early stages, but the middle, early stages of, of thinking about ways that we might work with this data. Um, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what, what you'd like to see done with it as well. Um, and that is all from us on the content side. Uh, I don't, uh, it looks like, okay, so Jennifer Decker, Ravit, this project is truly amazing. I was wondering whether you're concerned that provincial libraries will never beef up their preservation efforts and continue to re rely on us for this type of work. That is a very good question. Um, um, sorry, Jacqueline, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is from Jennifer um, and she's saying, uh, and I, I think this is probably a question for, for lots of folks in the GovDoc space as well, but um, this work is incredible. Are you concerned that provincial libraries will never beef up their preservation efforts if they can rely on Scholars Portal to do this type of work? Um, and Amber is saying there are similar conversations with federal government departments. Well, you know, we can only control what we can control. So, <laughs> so that's my answer, right? And, yeah. and um, on a personal level, when, when I get a vibe from the community that something is at risk and we need to act, then we act. 
um, mm -hmm. to ask you know the government to take responsibility on preservation efforts. Um, we know there are some uh, efforts being done by luck, but the content is not accessible. Um, the one thing I, I can say is that a project like the Think Tank, for example, uh, when we pulled PDF from um, files that are files that you sort of grab from the web, but you can't do much. You can present the content, but you really need to know what you're searching. And most of us don't really know which report from which think tank we're searching or which policy paper is out there or, or any other newsletter or whatever type of information. And so when we actually took all the PDFs from, from there and created metadata for them, clearly it's, it's, war, it's a work that goes beyond preservation. It's actually a lot of discoverability involved in that. And I don't think anyone can sort of uh, in the government will ever take part in that, that level of, um, of preservation and discoverability. So I think even if there were a repository out there, they're probably not as accessible as or friendly as you know university uh, services that universities can can provide provide to users because this is what we do per se, right? And this is our mandate. Um, mm -hmm. So this is my two cents. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a big question and that's a really good answer. Um, certainly a lot of our universities have been collecting and preserving in print for a long time. So I think um, we also see this as sort of the continuation of that work. Um, but you're right, our, our, our metadata, we're thinking about metadata perhaps a lot more than than any of them. I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, oh. Oh, sorry, a comment from Adam. Uh, on the retraction issue and using the example you showed, I see Scholar Squirtle keeps the article available with a watermark retracted. De Gruyter has pulled access to the article. Will SP be keeping access available generally or is it based on instructions from the pu publisher? So I didn't explain this, so it's a good question, Adam. Um, so things are not always flagged as uh, retractions in ways that are obvious and they're not flagged the same way from every publisher. So um, some publishers, when they send a retracted article, they send us a new copy of the article, but it's actually an empty page that just says this article has been retracted. Um, other publishers send us the article again with the retracted watermark. Uh, we should probably look at that De Gruyter example. Um, they chose to send us a watermarked article um, rather than sending us sort of a blank one or a pulled one. Um, so probably our, we need a little bit of fine tuning on what's happening there, but um, the fact that they sent us a retraction and sent us the full article, it, it can be a little bit hard to gauge um, what to do as we're not sort of looking at them on an individual level. But, but thank you for that because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big one to tackle and uh, definitely a work in progress. I think at this point I'm going to... Uh, Dick Greuter not always consistent. Let me tell you, that's the truth. Um, at this point, I think I'm going to uh, pass it over to my colleague, Ginsley, because um, we have a round of lightning talks coming up. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, and Ginsley, over to you. Looks like he's just getting set up. Yeah, we are running about 10 minutes behind. So if you're looking at the agenda, this is the this is the 1055 section. Hi, Ginsley. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Ginsley Molizea. I'm the virtual reference at Scholars Portal. Uh, this section is about Ocul Lightning Talk. We have two presentations in this section. Uh, I'm going to present each presenter. Um, if you have questions, feel free to answer them on the chat. And uh, I'm happy to see uh, so many of you. Uh, don't forget to, uh, to use our hashtag on Twitter, SPDay22. First, I'm delighted to welcome Charlotte Inerd. Um, Charlotte uh, Inard is the head collection development and acquisition at Wilfrid Laurier University 
and has been on many occult and scholar portal committees and group over the years. She has been on occult IR for over 18 years and is currently the chair of the occult video com community. Thanks. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Is that all good? Perfect. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about videos in the Ocal Scholars Portal context. Um, this year, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the journals platform. And over the years, I've done a lot, a lot <laughs> of consortial work with Ocal and Scholars Portal um, and continue to see so much innovation and development um, that has been of direct benefit to our students and faculty. Um, um, in reflecting on this time, and as a reference by Leslie during her presentation, there have been so many people that I've known and worked with, especially in the early years of Scholars Portals. I had the fortune of starting my career with Brian Nettlefold as my director. And uh, Brian was extremely supportive and encouraging to a new librarian, especially in doing consortial work. I also especially wanted to mention Faye Abrams. Faye was the person who coined the term, I think, Oakley. I can still picture her and hear her in the meetings, challenging and inspiring us to think bigger, broader, and Oakley. And when she retired, we had pins made that said, I think Oakley, and I'm, I don't think you could tell, but I'm wearing mine today. So there's a long history of collaboration with respect to media in Ontario. Interfilm was formed in the 1960s by participating Ontario institutions to share media that went through various formats throughout the years, 16 millimeter, VHS, et cetera. At my first Interfilm meeting in 2004, half the people were from outside of libraries. Since then, most, but not all media collections have moved into the library. Wanting to build on the spirit of collaboration, the Oco Video community was created in 2015 and got up and running shortly after that. This community meets regularly to share and support each other and we've worked on various small projects over the years. In 2021, the Oakal Video community spent time thinking about the opportunities that exist for us to think Oakley. We're still thinking about how to act on these, but I wanted to share them on this Scholars Portal Day, this day to think Oakley. And somehow saying think Scholars Portally doesn't quite roll off the tongue the same way, but I think it's the same kind of thing. So um, I do want to start with some fun facts about video acquisition. So one of the first challenges is that um, libraries are not the primary market for media distributors. Um, so that's in contrast to most other acquisitions that libraries undertake where we are one of the main um, markets. There's also a huge variety of vendors in media. So we have companies like ProQuest, and we have the small independent filmmaker who's ro roaming around the continent in their VW van, just an actual true story. Um, for a complex variety of issues, including, for example, the licensing of music in a film, there's very little available for perpetual purchase. Most of the demand for purchasing is driven by faculty. And most loaning needs to be done to classroom show dates, making booking a key service. And there are all sorts of licensing issues. And if you have international students trying to access content from their home country, there can be all sorts of barriers. Accessibility, whether captioning or descriptive video, is an ongoing challenge, especially since the Copyright Act and AODA are in conflict with each other. So what are some Oakley thinking opportunities? One question I get is, does Interfilm still exist? And the answer is sort of. As we look at lending media through Omni and the larger issue of interlibrary loans, we need to think about what that looks like. And I know there is an, a group in Oakle CF that's doing some work on this. And especially, we need to think about the issues around pre-booking for show dates and whether or not a licensing uh, permits ILL. How can we collaborate more effectively on acquisitions? How can we share vendor, vendor information? And if we were or were not able to find who owns a title, either in streaming or on DVD, especially but not only with Omni, can we harness metadata to be helpful? 
Can we make sure that it accurately reflects, reflects what accessibility the title has? Could we incorporate licensing, not just for packages, but those individual titles, which I said may or may not allow for interlibrary loan? And as we individually get permissions to add captioning and or described video, how can we share those files to not repeat the work? What does that look like, both practically and legally? If we need them to sign something, should we have a model agreement or license? This is especially difficult in the light of the small independent producers who are very difficult to locate and very difficult to get responses from. So I'll end with just a few other random notes uh, in my rapid lightning talk here. Um, so I think there's definitely an opportunity for us to do some advocacy work on these issues, especially around changes to the Copyright Act. I'll note that preservation is increasingly becoming discussed in many different um, media communities as older content deteriorates, rights become murkier, and we're starting to lose more and more titles. We're not the only group looking at this. The Film Studies Association of Canada, which is film studies faculty, this past year had a media access and copyright working group that has also been looking at these issues, and I was sitting on it this last year. And then I, along with the support of the Oakle Video community and other colleagues, created the Canadian Library Video List and Conference to create a national and multi-sector community. There's so much more that I could have talked about, including how the pandemic impacted this work. And I want to give a shout out to all my uh, colleagues on the Oakle Video community. We've had a lot of really good conversations over, the, over our existence. Um, videos continue to increase in their centrality to the pedagogy in film studies and, in, and in really across all dis disciplines. Libraries play an important role in the work, in this work, and by thinking Oakley, I think we can continue to improve the availability and accessibility to all our students and faculty. So thanks very much, and I'm not sure if we want to ask questions now or uh, keep going and ask questions after Amy's uh, presentation. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, okay. I have some couple of uh, thank you from our participant. Uh, as we are running just a bit late, so I will uh, go to the next presentation and come back if needed for question. Uh, our next presentation is from Amy Greenberg. Uh, Amy Greenberg is the Interim Associate Director uh, director of Scholars Portal and Co-Chair co of the OCUL Future of Resource Sharing Working Group. Thanks. Thanks, Kinsley. I'm back. I promise I'm going to be really quick this time. OK. Uh, and Charlotte, thank you for that great um, teeing up to this presentation uh, because I am indeed going to talk for a few minutes about the work of the uh, Future of Resource Sharing Working Group. Um, and I'll give you all a bit of background about this group. So this is a um, continuation of work that started in 2018 with the Future of Collections and Resource Sharing Working Group. Um, this was after a decision by OCL directors to really investigate how these two areas of collections and resource sharing intersect and inform each other and what that means for OCL's uh, future. Uh, so that work culminated in a report that was delivered in 2020. I put the link there um, to the wiki space where you can see the report and other documents created by that group. Um, then, you know, there was a pandemic, so it took a little bit of time, but eventually this group was reformed uh, in 2021 with a bit of a tighter focus on a racer, which I hope you all know by now, but is technically uh, end of life. The software will no longer be supported as of 2024. So we have a, a pretty um, uh, sharp uh, end of life for racer. Um, and, but, you know, still keeping collections in mind and just, again, looking ahead to that future of local resource sharing, especially with so many libraries now using Alma um, for various resource sharing functions uh, like the AFN for the Omni libraries and just looking at the overall resource sharing possibilities there. So there's, there's a lot going on and a lot to, a lot to consider. And this group is a really great one to consider those things because we have representation from the from resource sharing areas, from collections areas, from OCL IR, um, 
and from folks involved in collaborative futures and those uh, not involved in collaborative futures. So the deliverables um, of the group, basically the overall purpose of the group, uh, and I'm just going to read here from our terms of reference, is to plan for the end of life of RACER, defining requirements for a system or infrastructure that can meet OCL's requirements for resource sharing under an expanded definition of ILL that considers ebook lending, controlled digital lending, on-demand digitization, emerging resource sharing models such as uh, Omni, shared print programs, digital repositories, Keep It Downs View, and North slash Nord, which is Carl's National Shared Print Network Project. Um, so uh, there's that's a lot, and I would add um, because uh, I would add that uh, you know also considering different types of of resources that can be shared, like media and and AV and things that were traditionally maybe a little bit outside um, interlibrary loan. So that's all within the group's purview. So uh, we are making recommendations around a racer replacement, considering what OCA wants to achieve, um, to explore and optimize those connections between collections and resource sharing, which I know at some of your institutions, those traditionally silo departments are becoming perhaps a bit, um, you know, coming closer together. And to think about what the new opportunities are, um, as well as just also focusing on practical decision making. So, um, you know, and those would those would be things like finding um, a common ILL software for more seamless interocal sharing, um, controlled digital lending pilot projects, which are of emerging and continuing interest within Ogle and beyond. And we heard a little bit about that yesterday at one of the lightning talks. Um, and basically just making sure that we enable the future vision of shared collections, whatever that means, um, and other collaborative activities. Um, and I did highlight controlled digital lending there because I think given that this group has already been formed and it's on our radar, um, that this is a good place to have those conversations and, and to think about how we can take advantage of existing infrastructure that might enable those sorts of, those sorts of pilots. Um, so the next steps for the group are, um, we are this, these are things we're talking about. We haven't done them yet, but um, be on the lookout for some communication from us. Um, we're talking about the best way to do consultations, both at an operational level and a higher strategic level. So we're thinking about developing a really quick survey to be shared as broadly as possible. We want to meet with as many local communities and working groups and committees as possible. And we'll probably end up doing a few local wide webinars as well once we have some information from those initial consultations. We're also doing a bunch of other information gathering, just kind of taking stock of the landscape of resource sharing within Ogle and beyond in terms of what systems people are using, what those systems do, what they can enable. And so we're of course also wanting to reach out to peer consortia to look at what they're doing and how they've thought about these things. So lots more to come and um, stay tuned for more from us. And that is all for me. Thanks, Amy. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I will. Uh, thanks for uh, Charlotte and Amy. Thanks for uh, empowering us to think, uh, to think uh, oculi, and uh, as well as uh, thanks for working on different uh, uh, project on future of collection and resource sharing. Um, I will leave, uh, I will go back to uh, Sabina. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. Perfect. Uh, I guess uh, we'll, uh, Go for a sh short break up to uh, 11 for eight minutes, uh, and then we'll come back. Uh, I think we will actually uh, extend our break slightly. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to put up a slide here, uh, if you will indulge me for a second. <laughs> Um, we're going to um, go on break now, and uh, the main programming will start back up 
at approximately 1135, maybe a couple minutes afterwards. Um, this is the time for our pet parade. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break of approximately three minutes. Uh, so if you need to run and get your coffee, you can run and do that now. Uh, come back uh, at about 1125 uh, to do pet parade. Of course, this is completely optional. So if you don't want to, you don't have to stick around for that. Um, and then we will do our um, main part of our uh, programming will resume uh, so shortly after 1135. So just a slight agenda note. So I will mute myself for the next couple of minutes. Okay, folks, can you see the pet parade, pet parade slides? I hope yes. that they are coming through. Thank we you, We can Amy. see pets on parade. Okay, great. Okay, so um, welcome to the Pets on Parade, our fun break activity. Um, this is an, a, a um, slideshow that we put together based on pictures that were contributed by you um, of the pets, your pets are pets in your lives. So let's get going. And you can feel free to comment in the chat um, or do some uh, reactions uh, by how, about how cute these pets are. Okay, so first of all, we have Finn, who is a nine-year-old cat, and he is seen here helping with the crossword puzzle 
by laying his entire body across the newspaper. Uh, and this is submitted by Sarah from uh, Ottawa. Our uh, second contestant is uh, Archie, a beagle who is all dressed up as a leprechaun for St. Patrick's Day at the doggy daycare. He's got a cute little green leprechaun hat and a sparkly green bow tie and his own pot of gold. This is submitted by Lacey from Carlton. Next, we have Eugene Elf, who is a two-year-old cat, a tabby cat, and uh, she's seen here basking in the sunlight on her back, showing her tummy with her little white paws in the air. Very cute. Uh, this is submitted by Tamara at uh, McMaster. Up next, we have uh, Bella, who is a six-year-old Black uh, Australian Shepherd and Poodle mix, uh, submitted by uh, Debbie Chavez from Laurier, who notes that uh, Bella is named after Bellatrix, Bellatrix Lestrange from the Harry Potter books. And uh, Bella is seen here eating snow, which she loves to do. So uh, it's a co nice contrast, to the Black puppy on all the white snow. all over her snout too. This submission is from uh, Maria at the U of T um, of uh, Persic, who Maria referred to as uh, a demon cat. Uh, and uh, Persic is a, like got some gorgeous coloration, some like really nice uh, dark orange coloring with white markings. And Persic is helping out at work uh, by lying in a box, very cat-like, and swatting at the wireless mouse. Um, next up, we have uh, Gertie, the golden retriever, uh, who is taking a nap on the floor after a hard day's work of chewing the stuffing out of all of her toys, uh, which you can see the destroyed toys and, and uh, stuffing surrounding her on her on the floor there. And that's submitted by uh, Kara at U of T, our, our former scholar portal colleague. We used to get so many Gertie pictures. <laughs> it's hard work, but someone's got to do it. Very true. Up next, we have um, Oberon, who's a, a tabby cat with some white markings. And uh, like a lot of cats, he also likes to help out at work, uh, in this case, by standing right in front of the monitor and uh, blocking Jessica from getting anything done. So this is submitted by uh, Jessica, uh, our colleague here at Scholars Portal. Next up, um, this was submitted by uh, Leslie Weir, who was our keynote speaker yesterday. Uh, this is her grand puppy, uh, Sniffit, who is, I think, a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel um, with very, very soulful eyes staring right into the camera. Uh, next up, we have Lulu, a brown tabby cat who's sleeping all curled up in a white basket on the floor with a bright pink wall behind her. Nice to see a, a nice little cat nap. For those of you joining us, we are running about five minutes behind in our schedule, so we are still continuing the pet parade for a few more minutes, and then we'll move to the main part of our agenda. Uh, next up, we have Willow. Uh, this is submitted by Caitlin here at Scholars Portal. Uh, Willow is a rescue dog, and she's seen here cuddling on the couch with some snuggly blankets and pillows, looking up into the camera with her little paw beside her little uh, nose. Very adorable. Next up, we have Shadow, who is a, a gray tabby cat. And Shadow has decided she needs to nap right now and right on top of her mom's teaching notes. So she is seen here using a notebook as a pillow um, while she, she curls up and naps. This is submitted by Catherine from uh, U of T Scarborough.
Next up, we have an unconventional uh, sort of pet. Uh, this is a unnamed partridge, uh, which made me realize I don't know if I'd ever seen a partridge before, uh, other than you know the partridge in a pear tree thing. Uh, this is submitted by Jenna from Algoma and Scholars Portal. And uh, she says this partridge comes to her bird feeder every day and pe pecks away at all the seeds the squirrels have dumped on the ground. Uh, so I think that's a pet. It's kind of like an outdoor cat, an outdoor partridge. Uh, next up, we have uh, Fergus, who is a pale gray, almost a silver cat sitting on top of some kind of garden ornament statue, surveying his surroundings very alertly. He's got the wide open eyes and his ears sticking up. Uh, so this is submitted by Jacqueline from Scholars Portal. And uh, she made the note that Fergus is a majestic beast. There is definitely a theme of cats helping us work from home. Uh, here's another submission. This is submitted by Ashley from Laurier. And this is uh, Juan, her guide dog. And he's a black lab. And here he is upside down, biting his own foot in a very unprofessional fashion. Okay, up next, we have a cat condo type situation. So on the uh, upper penthouse level of the condo, we have, a, it looks like a tuxedo cat um, boots. On the ground floor, there's a gray tabby named uh, Bella, and this is submitted by Andrea from Guelph. <clears throat> All right, just a few more and then we'll wrap up and return to our main programming. Um, these two overgrown puppies in, who are enjoying the grass were submitted by Nancy from McMaster. Um, there's a golden retriever, Jaina, and a border collie, Jason, who are um, grinning at the camera with their tongues out. And um, Nancy mentioned that a very Star Wars deep cut, they're both named after the Solo twins who are the children of Han and Leia in the extended Star Wars universe because Nancy's kids are huge Star Wars fans. Uh, we have two cats submitted by uh, uh, Sophie from U Ottawa. Um, on the left, there's Patches, who's 13, who's a, I think that's a tortoise shell cat who's staring at the camera, asking for extra cuddles. On the right, there's Luna. Uh, and Luna was only a few weeks old when she was found on the day of the blood moon in 2015, which is where she got her name. Two very adorable cats. Uh, Sophie also, the, the chat has gone off on a Star Wars tangent, uh, but Sophie also submitted her two dogs who are seen here in their winter coats, getting ready to go outside with their little faux fur hoods and enjoy the cold Ottawa winters. And uh, on the left, there's Rosie, a black lab mix, who's also a rescue dog. And on the right, uh, Gizmo, who is a, a cockalier and who's a dog who will not play fetch. If you can believe that. Uh, this was a last minute edition. Uh, Mandy, who is our uh, outgoing collaborative futures, uh, everything really, uh, submitted a picture of her daughter's cat, Hank. It's a, a gray and white cat with these beautiful pale green eyes just staring at the camera. Uh, this is not exactly a pet, uh, this, but uh, I think it, it kind of counts. This was submitted by Chin Chin at Scholars Portal. And she said, uh, this is a, a house plant, uh, which I'm Dracaenea masangeana. I, I, I butchered that Latin, definitely. Uh, a potted plant originally. It's now as tall as the ceiling or maybe even taller. There's like a string holding the end of it uh, up. And um, Chin Chin has had this plant for 20 years since it was barely the length of her arm and has nurtured it um, through, through all this process for 20 years. So I mean, as much as of a pet as many, as, as many uh, actual animals taking a lot of care and love uh, to grow this big. Everyone is very impressed uh, that uh, a plant has been alive and thriving for this long. And I agree, I could never keep a plant alive that long. Okay, this is the last one, I promise. This is the most low maintenance pet. It is a papier mache moose 
with googly eyes and some very prominent faux fur eyebrows uh, submitted by Robin from Guelph. So yes, a low maintenance pet, hypoallergenic pet, gotta love it. All right, uh, so that wraps up our pet parade. If I can, there we go. Uh, thank you for uh, indulging. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we are going to, in a moment, return to our regularly scheduled programming only a few minutes behind schedule. Uh, so just quick housekeeping notes, just a reminder that the slides for today's session um, can be found on Spot Docs if you would like to download them. And uh, we uh, do ask that you keep your mics muted when you're not speaking and uh, to put your questions in the chat and use the reactions feature to share applause or give the love to our presenters. Um, I also just want to quickly thank uh, my colleagues who've been helping out with Zoom, diligently dropping in links and uh, helping out with all of that. Uh, so that's Mohana and Harpinder who've been helping out so far this morning. All right, I am now going to pass uh, the session over to my colleague um, Grant, who is the Digital Preservation Librarian here at Scholars Portal, who will kick off our, pr our presentation about uh, preservation and storage services. All right, hello everyone. Um, thanks for welcoming me to talk about preservation. Following the pet parade is, is extraordinarily difficult <laughs> in the agenda. It's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best to excite you about our other furry friends, digital preservation. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Awesome, that's great. Um, so yeah, my name is Grant Hurley. I'm the Digital Preservation Librarian at Scholars Portal. Um, I'm also really excited to be joined today by Sacha Miller at the University of Ottawa. She's a digital archivist there who will um, talk a bit at the end about how um, she's using some of our services uh, in her work there. So I'm gonna be talking about two broad services, the Ontario Library Research Cloud and uh, Permafrost. So I'll start with the OLRC. As a reminder, for those of you who might be new to the OLRC, um, the objective is to provide cost-effective, subscription-based, scalable, and reliable storage for libraries and archives to house and support access to their digital collections. Um, it's based on the OpenStack Swift object storage architecture, um, and it makes use of five data centers, which we call nodes, which are located at academic libraries here in Ontario. So there's one at uh, University of Toronto, at York, Guelph, Queens, and Ottawa. Um, and we use the Orion and GTA net high-speed private networks to connect them all. Um, these are locations of the, those nodes um, on a map. So you can see, you know, they're dispersed across uh, Ontario here, which provides us with great geographical redundancy, which is an ideal for, for cloud storage. Um, and we're really grateful for uh, those universities for supporting um, this network. It would be impossible to run it without, without their help and assistance. Some of the features of the LRC um, are availability. So whenever um, a file or digital object is uploaded to the LRC, it's replicated three, three times across those five locations to ensure that those files are always there for you. Um, if there was like a power outage, let's say at Guelph or another node were to go offline for some reason, those files get copied over to a new location. And so it's always trying to maintain this balance um, of availability. And in the same sort of fashion, um, another key feature is reliability. So Files are internally checked for integrity. Um, and if there's a copy in one location that's found to be corrupted, it's replaced from a, um, a good copy in another location. Um, another key aspect of the LRC is flexibility. So there are all sorts of methods to integrate with and access the LRC. Um, we have her, um, interfaces called Horizon and DuraCloud, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, command line interface, and it also talks S3. So any applications that use the Amazon S3 uh, commands or API, can also interact with the OLRC. So it means that it can be integrated into all sorts of workflows and, and software. Um, the OLRC has been 
in production for quite a while. It was developed in 2012 to 15 with, with those OCO project partners, launched in production in 2017. Um, in 2018, we started the permafrost service, uh, which uses the OFC as a core component. So I'll talk a lot about that in a minute. Um, and then this year, there's been all sorts of activity. You can see a bunch of stuff just happening over 2021, 22. So we launched OFC nationally. So it's available for libraries to subscribe outside of OCO. Uh, the Dataverse repository um, started using the OFC as its core storage component this year as well. And then we underwent a huge migration project um, over the course of 2021, 2022, to new hardware and software, which we'll talk about, um, and introduce Dirt Cloud as another way of interacting with the OLRC. Um, some quick stats, though, for those of you that like numbers. Um, five years in production, right, since 2017. We have 15 subscribers across Canada, um, primarily within OCO, but we were really happy to have Concordia University and St. FX uh, join us as our first subscribers outside of OCO. There have been over 50 million objects uploaded to the OLRC. We have 145 terabytes of data in storage, and there's 500 terabytes of usable storage that's available at this point. Um, and if you think about that replication between those three locations, that's actually one and a half uh, petabytes of raw storage um, that is available as part of the network, which um, has grown exponentially over the years. Um, as I mentioned, we had this big migration project this year. Um, I'm really grateful for, for all the work of the Spells Portal Systems team uh, who supported the movement of this data. Um, we moved OLRC data from new uh, old hardware, essentially, to new hardware and software. Um, so we placed hardware at those five storage locations with increased processing power, um, which increases the capacity and performance of the OLRC, and then increased storage space as well. Um, uh, up to that 500 terabytes or one and a half petabytes uh, that I mentioned earlier. And as part of this, we, we took the opportunity as well to upgrade uh, OpenStack Swift uh, to a much more recent version, which enabled all sorts of new features and functions for the OLRC. Um, just to give you a picture of how data is organized, subscribers are assigned what's called the domain in the OLRC. Um, that's a broad sort of organizational bucket and then within each domain, you can set up multiple projects, which would be devoted to a particular um, content type or, or project at an institution, right? It's, it's an organizing principle. Within projects, you can contain uh, containers, um, which themselves contain files or folders. Um, and so this hierarchical kind of arrangement mirrors what you might be used to in like a file system arrangement um, and allows for you to organize your data in the ORC in, in a cohesive way and grant access to one project or another um, so that different staff members can use the ORC for different purposes. So I'll walk you through some of those new features um, that we introduced as a result of the migration this year. Talk about security, uh, the Horizon interface, Dura Cloud, public access to stored files, and new avenues for support and communications. So as I mentioned, those nodes are connected by a VPN, a virtual private network uh, in Orion and GTA net. So the traffic for the OLRC doesn't touch the public internet, which adds a real um, great layer of security. Proxy, proxy server connections use something called transport layer security, and they're authenticated and restricted to authorized IP addresses that are associated with our subscribers. Um, and then those individual nodes at those locations follow their own data center um, security protocols, like firewalls, and then phys you know, physical security measures as well. But one new feature is that we've added encryption at rest for stored data, which means that at its uh, storage in the node location, any data in OLRC is, is encrypted. And so that would um, prevent the risk of a breach at one of those data centers or nodes. Um, and as a result, um, subscribers, member institutions don't need to manage encryption themselves, um, which would be complicated and, and kind of messy. So it, it does add considerable security to um, the system. Um, so this year, um, our team members have been really working to improve an interface called Horizon, which is developed by OpenStack Swift. It's part of their kind of like default way of interacting with um, cloud-based networks like this. Um, it was a replacement for uh, an interface we had called Swift Browser. Um, and so we've been introducing all sorts of improvements to Horizon on top of what the sort of default application ha had available. Um, it has all sorts of easy upload and file management features, which make it fairly intuitive to get data into the OLRC. Um, it has that sort of granular user management now that we didn't have before. So 
As I mentioned, staff and institutions can be assigned to particular projects um, based on their work. Um, it's also possible to assign read-only access so that there's no risk of somebody accidentally deleting data. Um, in the same mode as well, we can protect container contents from accidental deletion or modification as well to have that sort of extra layer of assurance there. Um, and we also introduced um, improvements to a usage panel so you can track your data usage and costs over time um, over the course of each uh, fiscal year. And that chart on the right shows um, a bar graph of, of increased usage, for example, for um, one area of the LRC. <clears throat> Another exciting development <clears throat> was the introduction of DuraCloud, which is an open source application developed by DuraSpace, which is part of uh, Lyricis. Um, a couple of years ago, 2019 to 20, uh, Scholars Portal was funded by Canary to develop DuraCloud to work with the OLRC as a storage location. And essentially, DuraCloud kind of sits on top of the OLRC and uh, manages data that's stored uh, via the application. Some advantages to using DuraCloud with the OLRC um, are in particular for preservation. So um, it provides at least twice yearly health checks, they call it, which uh, is an independent fixity check against the stored database value. So it adds a secondary level, kind of independent level of integrity checking um, in addition to what the OLRC does by itself. So you just have that sort of secondary um, source of truth um, and integrity. And you can also store and synchronize independent copies of files in different places. So if you have high value content materials in your collections, you would like the assurance of a secondary copy, um, a completely independent copy that you could store on Amazon or some other um, connected cloud storage location. DuraCloud enables you to <coughs> synchronize that um, process of uploading that content to that other place. Um, DuraCloud also comes with content transfer and retrieval tools, really um, fairly easy to set up. Um, it also has uh, public access to container contents. Um, and I think as well as some really great opportunities um, for integrations with Archivit <clears throat> and DSpace to uh, preserve uh, the outputs of, of those sorts of tools in, in the OLRC using DuraCloud. Um, I mentioned another great feature of the OLRC, which is public access. And this would be through the Horizon interface primarily, but as I said, DuraCloud could do this as well where you can set a particular container in the OLRC is available for public access. And then you can generate stable URLs um, for all sorts of possible uses. Um, you could import, import those URLs in access repositories and digital exhibits, and Satya Miller is going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, you could share those URLs with students or faculty or public users. Um, and the OLRC has really easy streaming um, of video and audio, um, which enables you to play videos directly from the OLRC. Um, as well as audio so that you could, again, integrate those things into repositories. A screenshot on the right is actually from the University of Ottawa's um, digitized collections. Um, it's the start of like a, a, a digitized video, so it has that kind of like VHS look. Um, we also have been testing something that would enable you to limit access by, based on IP. So if you wanted to um, limit access to particular content just as you know, members of your institution, um, that that is potentially possible, it's something we're still kind of interested in, in developing further. So if that's a, a feature that's of interest to you, certainly get in touch with us. Um, there's additional areas of support as well. So we have a new user guide that's hosted on the SP Learn site, um, which uh, guides you through the OLRC and, and how to use it. There's a community newsletter that we've been sending around as well. And of course, you can contact us, uh, cloud at Scholars Portal Info anytime. All right, so um, I'll move on to Permafrost to just talk about what's been happening with that service. So Permafrost makes use of the OLRC um, in combination with a tool called Archimatica, which is an open source application for extracting preservation metadata, converting file formats for preservation and access, and constructing well-formed archival information packages for long-term storage and dissemination information packages for access. And so we're able to send those packages of data that are processed using um, Permafrost or using the Archimatica tool to the OLRC as that um, preservation storage location. And the permafrost service also comes with all sorts of training and documentation and consultation that, that builds on those tools. Um, the subscribing institutions that use permafrost um, use it for born digital and digitized materials that are unique to their institution primarily. So they're either held by archives and special collections units or other um, units at the library. It could be digitized photograph uh, and AV collections um, born digital records from private donors or perhaps like organizational records from the university 
uh, geospatial data and maps is another key use case, as well as research data with long-term value that um, institutions might wish to preserve outside of the context of an application like Dataverse. Um, and you can see the photos here on the right are from um, one of our subscribers, University of Waterloo, um, who's been preserving the outputs of a huge digitization project of a photographic um, negative collection that comes from a local newspaper. Um, so they have thousands and thousands of these photographs uh, preserved using the permafrost service. Um, it's also time to celebrate. We, permafrost has been in operation uh, for five years now, which is really exciting. So it was piloted by Lakehead University in 2017, and then they were joined by three other institutions, Waterloo, Laurier, and Toronto in, in 2017-18. We launched it in production in September 2018. Now we have um, 11 subscribing institutions with 12 hosted Archimatic instances. And that permafrost data that stored in the OSC also went, underwent a big migration project uh, just recently. We just wrapped it up last week, actually, and um, all that data has been moved safely over to the new uh, hardware and software infrastructure. I'm also really proud that the, the use of the service has grown really considerably over the years. So you can see in this little chart, um, the quantity of archival packages that have been stored year by year. Um, we started in 2018 with 150 megabytes, and now we're up to um, three and a half terabytes with almost 800 archival information packages uh, stored by our subscribers. With that migration, um, we changed also the way that, that data flows through the permafrost system. So as always, data is packaged up at a member institution on their local systems. It could be materials from a shared drive um, or you know, outputs of digitization projects that have been hanging around on shared drives for a while. Sometimes institutions also migrating content from legacy media like floppy disks or hard drives, um, external hard drives, USB keys, They're not really legacy media, but <laughs> rescuing data off of those um, some sometimes um, fragile storage media. That um, data gets uploaded to Horizon as a way for it to be processed by Archimatica. Institutions are then provisioned uh, an instance of Archimatica that's just for them, their own use. It's not shared with anybody else. And then those outputs, the archival information package, goes to DuraCloud um, and you know, takes advantage of all those um, great features in DuraCloud for um, archival data preservation storage. And then the access copies go back to Horizon um, for potential use, again, of those um, public access options or um, just to have like a private access copy that could be um, sent to, to researchers on a request basis or something like that. Uh, I've developed a bit of a comparison between these services, just to give a sense of how they kind of fit together. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna go through them all in great detail, but uh, the slides will be available after if you'd like to take a closer look. But if you think about it sort of um, in terms of increasing levels of preservation intervention, the Oler C itself, is you know the base level really we have that flexible available reliable storage infrastructure which kind of allows us to do much more with it and so using the olrc by itself would be for those collections that are more frequently updated or accessed some folks use it for systems backups certainly for uh, public access to materials uh, through those static links um, hosting static websites streaming audiovisual content all sorts of stuff the duracloud application that's backed by the olrc um, is more specific to preservation storage management because of that integrity checking and synchronization features. Um, these collections would be less frequently updated or added to, I would say, um, but there's real use here for digitized collections, especially when you have access copies that are created or managed in some other kind of place or repository. Um, and Duracloud would be a great place to store preservation copies of rep digital repository contents like the DSpace instance uh, because of that integration. Same thing with uh, the outputs of web archiving projects um, through that archiving integration. And then finally, um, permafrost essentially combines all these things, right? We've got Archimatica and DuraCloud and the ORC kind of all together, right? Um, this is a much more, I think, sort of high touch labor intensive process um, for um, especially suitable for, for um, foreign digital collections and digitized collections that are really high value to the institution. And it does this sort of kind of more intensive workflow by preparing and packaging files, ingesting descriptive metadata, doing a lot of automated uh, metadata extraction. And it can do that file format conversion for preservation and access copies too. So if you need a tool that will automatically create access derivatives for you, then um, Archimatica can do that. 
Um, and again, used for, you know, by institutions for born digital archival records, digitized collections where they need to create access copies, research data, GIS and maps, um, and there's also integrations and workflows with Atom. Um, and so I'm happy to talk to more about uh, the differences between these services, but hopefully this gives you kind of a bigger picture of uh, where they all fit in the preservation landscape. But I'm very happy to have uh, Sachi Miller here to talk to you more about how um, she's using Permafrost at the University of Ottawa. So take it away, Sacha. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Let me know if I'm talking and no one can hear, but I think it's good. Um, so as uh, Grant mentioned, my name is Satya Miller. I'm the digital archivist at the U Ottawa Library, Archives and Special Collections, and I'll be touching on my work uh, making available online select audio, video, image, and textual digital archival material um, from our women's archives, which contains roughly 170 fall and collections on the history of women and the women's movement in Canada. Uh, so after the records have been prepared for long-term preservation using Archive Manica and they've been stored in the OLRC, I will request uh, from the Permafrost team the creation of URLs to the access copies uh, located in the DIP, uh, also known as the Dissemination Information Packages. So once I receive um, the URLs in a spreadsheet, I'll then map them to item level descriptions in a metadata CSV spreadsheet. Um, and once that metadata CSV is formatted with the URLs and the description, I'll proceed to uploading them to Atom, which contains uh, descriptions from our archival uh, phone. Um, on the right, you can see I've screenshotted one of our collections, which contains uh, 14 video uh, files in the Constitute collection, which was donated by Susan Basili, who is a lawyer, educator, and a global entrepreneur uh, dedicated to the what rights of women. Uh, she's also the creator of the International Women's Rights Project, which has a website um, that we are in the process of archiving using Archivit. So I might look into that, um, Archivit into integration. Um, also, um, one item to note from the Constitute collection is a documentary film, uh, which documents uh, the Women's Constitutional Conference, which was held February 14th in 1981 here in Ottawa on Parliament Hill. And this conference uh, was held to ensure that the equal rights of women were included in the Canadian Constitution's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, section 15 and 18. So now these videos um, are available for people to look at. Next slide, please. Another collection I wanted to highlight is called the Second Wave Feminism Oral History Collection, which contains um, 99 oral history interviews from women across the country, including Alberta, British Columbia, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, uh, Ontario, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. And um, this collection is the result of findings from the Second Wave Archival Project which aim to document the history of second wave feminism in Canada. So a big project, and there was a lot of collaboration between the project and the archives here at the Ottawa Library. Um, but the project was organized by Canadian Senator Nancy Ruth and Beth Atchison, and the interviews were conducted by Bronwyn Bragg, who was a graduate student and lead researcher and interviewer at the time. So um, I just wanted to give a highlight of some great collections. I'm happy to share some links, and uh, please feel free to get in touch if anybody wants to talk about um, uploading digital objects to Atom or digital archives in general. I'm open. Into it. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank Bonjour. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sacha. Uh, it's so wonderful to shine a light on how people are actually using a service like Permafrost and the incredibly valuable, irreplaceable collections that you're preserving um, at, at the University of Ottawa. So yeah, it's been such a pleasure to work with you on this, on this project. And so exciting for me to see um, these materials accessible online using, using our tools and services. Great. We're very happy to have your expertise on uh, <laughs> speed dial. 
Thanks. <laughs> um, but on that note, actually, um, happy to answer any questions or, or talk about these services more, but you can find out more about both services at cloud.scholarsportal.info, permafrost.scholarsportal.info, and have our email addresses there to reach out as well. Um, and of course, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now as well. But um, yeah, thanks again, Satya, for joining us. It was really kind of you to, to give some time today. Oh, thanks, Carolyn. That's nice of you to say. <laughs> Stop sharing my slides now, but um, pause a minute and see if there's any other questions. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk about digital preservation, storage services. There's so much that's happened over the last few years. Uh, at Skulls Portal, and it's all starting to coalesce, especially after that um, big migration project. So, um, I feel like we're in a good in a good place to move forward with all sorts of these um, systems and services now that they're talking to one another. Oh, it's nice to see you, Renee. Thanks for joining us today. All right, thanks. And I saw there was a lot of appreciation in the chat and also a lot of applause coming in through the uh, reactions feature. So uh, thank you. Um, and if there are no questions, then we will move on to our next presentation. Um, Amber Leahy will uh, moderate this next session about uh, data services at Scholars Portal. So take it away, Amber. Okay, can can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Looks good. This slide, slide share it. There we go. Yes. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this session is uh, talking about data services, although listening to some earlier conversations and um, presentations, especially Art Rhino's, Really, digital collections are all data, but I'm going to be talking about um, or introducing you to some uh, to some presentations and speakers today, looking at data services, including the Dataverse repository, which um, is for research data collections, um, brought to you by institutional libraries and and research institutions across Canada. We have the Scholars Geo Portal platform, which is a longstanding Scholars Portal uh, service since 2012, as Amy mentioned earlier on in the day, which provides um, access to a number of licensed and open geospatial data collections from across OCO. And Odyssey, which has uh, also been a longstanding service here at Scholars Portal, providing access to social science survey data sets. Um, through government and institutional archives across OCL and beyond. Okay, so I just I did want to briefly go over just a few things. I think that's changing my slides. So I'll just I'll, I'll briefly mention that, that there is continued use of the services um, and uh, new collections being loaded across across the data services. We have seen a growth and an expansion of the service models over the years. And we have many participating libraries now, especially for the Dataverse service, which has now grown to over 60 institutions using the service. And this year, I feel like, and maybe the past couple years have been really focused on major infrastructure upgrades and renewal. So we're gonna hear from, um, from both Kara Hadron and Rene Duplan from the University of Ottawa uh, about the GeoPortal project. And we're going to hear from Alexandra Cooper, uh, Queen's University, talking about Odyssey. Um, and then we increasingly have just like these, these new research data collections coming into libraries and, and, and libraries really being challenged with, with these new areas of practice around research data management and research data preservation. So we're really excited to hear from uh, Megan Goodchild uh, and Alicia Capello from Queen's University and Scholars Portal to talk more about um, the Core Trust Seal certification project. 
So here's just an overview of the session. We're going to have um, Alicia and Megan start it off, and then we're going to have Kara and Renee talk about the geo portal next. And then finally, we're going to have Alexandra Cooper from Queens talk about um, Odyssey Future Directions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask Alicia and Megan to um, introduce the first session and get started. And then at the end, we're going to allow for some Q&A with the audience. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Remember, I'm just going to share my screen. Great, I guess I'll get us started. Um, hello everyone, we're really pleased to be here today to share um, about some activities that are happening around Core Trust Sealed or CTS project at Scholars Portal and also locally at Queen's University. So next slide, please. So thank you, Amber, for the introduction. We thought we'd also offer a few more details about ourselves, which might explain why we're so interested in this topic. So in Alicia's former role at Scholars Portal, she led the Dataverse CTS certification project, and she's now the research data management librarian at Queen's University, where I have the pleasure of calling her my colleague. Um, I'm the research data management systems librarian at Queen's University and Scholars Portal, where I've been facilitating the continuing activities of the Dataverse CTS certification project. So as you can see, we sort of have a unique combination of experiences um, to discuss these activities that are happening at Scholars Portal and also locally at Queen's. We thought we would start by providing a, a brief overview of the context for this project. Um, Canadian researchers are increasingly interested in depositing and sharing their data, which intersects with the final stages of the research data life cycle as shown below. Um, there are inherent benefits of sharing and reuse. Research data have the potential to be reused and recombined in really innovative ways to derive maximum value and accelerate scientific discovery. And there are also now policy requirements that are driving some change. The tri-agency RDM policy released last year outlines requirements for researchers to deposit research data into a digital repository with an expectation to provide appropriate access to the data where possible and this is a phased implementation beginning in March, 2023. So therefore, there really is a real need for research data repositories that are secure, trustworthy, and also sustainable. So one repository option available to researchers is this national bilingual multidisciplinary dataverse repository, which has been hosted at Scholars Portal since 2012. Although it began as an OCL service, it now includes 60 institutions from across Canada, and it's governed by representatives from the four regional library consortia, OCL, COPL, BCI, and CAL. Uh, the platform has grown to over 8,000 data sets, 178,000 files, and 10 million downloads. I wanted to highlight that although in this presentation we are calling the service Scholars Portal Dataverse, which reflects its origins as an OCL service, we are in the process of renaming, and this is to better reflect the new identity of the national service. So please stay tuned for an announcement at the end of the month with our new name and other details. Um, but for now, we're just gonna focus on uh, Scholars Portal Dataverse CTS project. Great, I'll thanks. Um, so as some of you may know, uh, Core Trust Seal or CTS um, is a data repository certification that's based on 16 different trustworthy data repository requirements that were taken and combined from the previous World Data Systems and the Data Seal of Approval organizations. Uh, currently, the application, the way that the application for CTS certification works is that all the major components of a data repository are included right from collections management to digital infrastructure. And they don't really care who is managing or responsible for each of those components. But at the moment, Scholars Portal is a service provider and only manages the digital infrastructure component of the repository. While each individual institution, as Megan mentioned, and there's um, 60 of them now, manage the policies and procedures associated with their individual collections. 
This setup means that there's currently no way for either Scholars Portal or an individual institution to apply for CTS certification completely on their own. Instead, each institutional collection can become certified but they will need to include information about the digital infrastructure from Scholars Portal. So the main purpose of any type of CTS certification is to provide transparent documentation regarding the management and functionalities of the data repository being certified. Therefore, every application needs to have documentation from both Scholars Portal and each institution who's applying when it comes to Scholars Portal Dataverse. The good news is that all of the documentation associated with the digital infrastructure that Scholars Portal um, supports would be exactly the same for every single one of the institutions that's a part of the program. The only thing that would need to change between the applications is the documentation that explains how each individual institution manages their collections. So this was the reason why we decided to start the Scholars Portal Dataverse CTS project cohort, so that we could work together to come up with all of the required documentation for a CTS application. And we started off um, with 12 different institutions that we have here on the slides. Um, we kind of did this in a step-by-step -step process. So the very first step that we took um, within this project was to conduct a gap analysis where we broke down the requirements for each of those 16 um, items that would appear on the CTS application. And we basically broke them down between what was needed by Scholars Portal and what was needed by each institution. The next step once the gap analysis was completed was to review the items that Scholars Portal needed to document from a digital infrastructure perspective. Uh, in order to figure out what sort of documentation would satisfy CTS requirements, we reviewed over a dozen different successful CTS applications, which are all publicly available on the CTS website. And we focused specifically on repositories that used the Dataverse platform so that we were comparing apples to apples. From that review, we determined that there were basically six documents that if Scholars Portal was able to create or update, it would satisfy all of the CTS requirements for the digital infrastructure portion of the application. And Megan's gonna talk about these documents a little bit um, more in a future slide. The other half of the project was on the institutional side, which was to conduct a similar investigation um, where we use those same successful CTS applications to look at documentation examples, but this time from the perspective of the items that each institution would need to satisfy the requirements. And from this analysis, we determined that there was basically four main documents that we would need at an institutional level to satisfy the CTS requirements. And that was something associated with collections development, something associated with deposit guidelines, something associated with the curation procedures, and then deaccession procedures. So with the assistance of the Dataverse North Policy Working Group, which was through the Digital Research Alliance of Canada or formerly Portage Network, we developed a set of guidelines for each of these four documents that each of the institutions could use to either update or develop those particular items for their institutional collection. So the last step was to create an application template that would provide content and directions to the participating institutions. So using the gap analysis, we were able to go through each requirement in the application and write out the portions that Scholars Portal was responsible for. And we were also able to provide guidance for the institutions outlining what they needed to include for each requirement or if the scholars portal response would be sufficient. Uh, given the name change that's currently underway and the need to update the appropriate links in the, the template, we're aiming to have this template completed in June or July in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. Great. 
So as a summary of the uh, CTS project documents, we are in the process of finalizing and translating the Scholars Portal related documentation, um, including the terms of use, the technology infrastructure and security information, preservation plan, privacy statement, as well as updating our user guide, creating a new admin guide and a, a, the application template, as I mentioned before. And these bilingual documents will be available in June or July, and they will reflect the new name of the service. Additionally, the institutional dataverse collection policy templates are actually currently available now on spot docs and these are in early release uh, with French translations pending and they're licensed to be shared uh, CC by and again these templates can be used to help create policies that describe local practices related to selecting depositing curating and deaccessioning data sets as Alicia discussed before. So as a case study, we will now turn um, our turn to our project at Queen's University Library to develop a CTS application. The library has managed the Queen's Dataverse collection since 2013 as one of the early adopters. And data curation services have been built around depositing data into the collection, including a mediated or white glove service and also um, review of researcher deposited data sets as well. These uh, services are documented in various um, documents and guides, both internal and external. And our RDM team currently includes um, Alicia, Alex Cooper, and myself. We have um, a relatively compressed timeline to complete our application, but we are really motivated to submit this year because we believe it really provides an explicit value proposition to researchers who are interested in finding a repository to deposit and share their data. So in December, um, the Queen's Library approved our project charter, and this was an important step to outline our approach, obtain staffing resources, and also secure the funding for the application fee. Since then, we've been um, doing project planning, and we're currently conducting our own gap analysis, where we've been reviewing our current documentation, both internal and, and public facing, and outlining what we need to update. And um, over the next few months, we're going to be doing a sprint to um, edit and update this documentation. And we're planning on completing and submitting our application, hopefully by October. And throughout this process, we have been really benefiting from the activities, resources, and support of both the CTS like Canada cohort and also the Scholars Portal Dataverse CTS cohort as well. Um, so while working on both of the Scholars Portal Dataverse CTS project and assessing the needs of Queens specifically for CTS, we came across a couple of challenges that we wanted to mention. Um, first is that while the gap analysis and application templates divide the CTS requirements between Scholars Portal and Queens, it still takes a little time to work out where, how, and why that divide exists between the two organizations. And it's especially true when Queens uses optional functionality that's available in the Dataverse platform. Um, another challenge that only came to light uh, in the last couple of months is the rush to get the application completed um, before the portal that CTS operates closes in the fall. Um, they're currently planning to close it in September, October, although they don't have a specific date yet. And so we would really like to get our application in before that date so that it only needs to be based upon the existing CTS requirements that were for the years 2020 to 2022. Uh, if we miss that deadline, then we will need to update our application to reflect the next set of requirements that would be effective from 2023 to 2025. Um, some other challenges regarding CTS certification is, of course, the time consuming aspect of having to write and update documentation. And while this is really important work, it does require the proper resourcing and capacity, which can be a little bit difficult to come across in summer months, but we, that's why we're working on doing a sprint. Um, and overall, the process to become CDS certified is a very valuable experience that allows you as a repository administrator to take a step back and assess your repository at the big picture level. Um, and it can be worthwhile because does, it not only raises the reputation and trustworthiness of your repository when it becomes certified, but it helps ensure that everyone who is using that repository is on the same page in terms of how things work. So it's very well worth the time and effort. 
and it's still there we go it'll advance the next slide so that was the end of our presentation um, but if you have any questions we will be happy to answer them or you can also email us and we will get back to you great thank you so much megan and alicia um, if you have any questions you can put them in the chat and we can answer them at the end of the session um, so I'm going to pass it over now to uh, Kara Hendren from the University of Toronto and Renee Deplan from the University of Ottawa, who are going to talk to us about Scholars GeoPearl. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. All right. Is everybody able to see my slides? That's good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you for inviting us to, to chat about this today. Uh, my name is Kara Hander and I'm a data librarian at the University of Toronto and I'm here with my colleague Renee Duplain, who is a GIS librarian at the University of Ottawa. Renee and I are the co-chairs of the GeoPortal Business Case Working Group, which has just recently, as in yesterday, submitted a formal business case to OCO for reinvestment in the GeoPortal. So today we're going to be providing a brief overview of the background, the work done to date, and the proposal that we've submitted. So the GeoPortal is a platform designed to support search, discovery, exploration, and dissemination of generally licensed geospatial data resources. It's a custom-built application that launched in 2012 that is available to all member libraries and is managed by Scholars Portal. Since launch, the GeoPortal data content has expanded greatly from less than 300 data sets to over 5,000 data layers and over 3 million aerial images. It's hard to understate the value of having something like the GeoPortal as a one-stop shop. Unlike other GIS data catalogs, the GeoPortal allows users not only to discover the data, but to download it. In doing so, it also provides a level of equity of access across OCL, where consortially licensed data is accessible in the same way, regardless of the size or resources of an individual institution. A one-stop shop like this, of course, is also an excellent teaching tool for new GIS users that doesn't require any additional setup or authentication beyond institutional uh, authentication or institutional logins. Since it launched in 2012, OCL has no doubt benefited from significant cost savings through shared cost of ownership and a reduced need for redundant infrastructure, reduced duplication of effort by a centralized staffing and reduced costs for data subscriptions as a result of consortial licensing. So I won't have time to go into it in detail here, but I just wanted to provide some examples of some of the data types available via the GeoPortal. So some topographic maps in the foreground, some historical data, and some newer uh, road network files in the background, just to illustrate the varied uses of the service. So while the GeoPortal continues to serve the community and to handle our consortially licensed collections, there is no doubt that the community itself has changed significantly since 2012. GIS is a growth area that is reaching into new disciplines that have new needs. And in addition to that, the formats of the data and the data size of the data have grown significantly. On top of this, and also somewhat because of it, users want to be able to access and interact with the data in new ways. And all of these new requirements have been balanced on top of an aging infrastructure. So the Oakle Geo community has been working towards a reinvestment in the geo portal for several years now via several working groups. In 2017, a working group conducted a survey to assess satisfaction of the GeoPortal and identify potential areas for improvement. In 2019, the GeoPortal Reinvestment Working Group was established under Ocal SP and was, was tasked sorry, with assessing possible infrastructure replacements. This group identified some options for further investigation and recommended the development of a detailed business plan. This resulted in the establishment of the GeoPortal Business Case Working Group under SPOD in 2020. October 2020. During 2020 and 2021, this working group gathered information to put forward a proposal for a phase one redevelopment to perform essential infrastructure upgrades, including an upgrade of the underlying Esri Enterprise server, as well as some much needed updates to the front end interface, including HTTPS enabling and bug fixes. This work is ongoing and near completion. As part of planning for phase two while completing work on phase one, the working group consulted extensively with stakeholders, explored the solutions that had been previously identified as possible replacements, and continued conversations with vendors. And as mentioned, a business case was just submitted for review. So given that whirlwind a tour of a lightning talk, I'm going to pass it over to my co-chair Renee to talk more in detail about the information gathering process and what recommendations that process led us to. 
Thank you, Kara. So as we work towards our recommendations for the new platform, we solicited feedback from a few key groups. So this included a detailed survey of the community. So library staff who are working with GIS and geospatial across local. Uh, we also followed this up with a survey of researchers looking for specific case studies and examples of how the GeoPortal has been used and will continue to be used to support research and instruction. We also did a SWOT analysis to assess other available vendors and out of the box solutions. We held a few meetings with Esri, the, the current vendor of the, uh, the current platform to dive into the functionality of their backend and see what other tools could be leveraged in, with new technologies. And uh, ultimately used all of this information to draft two documents, a summary business case and also a detailed functional requirements document. And as Kara mentioned, these were just submitted to SPOT for review. Next slide, please. So just a, a glimpse at uh, some of the summary that we got from that first survey for the community. So we have an average of 822 GIS and geospatial data interactions per institution per year. 94% um, of institutions have an ESRI site license, meaning they have uh, familiarity with the platform, well-established access to, uh, to it and to their communities. And uh, we had over a thousand ArcGIS online accounts on average per institution, meaning integration with this online platform was also a priority for us. Next slide, please. And so outside of the traditional GIS users in geography and forestry, we also wanted to get a sense of what disciplines were emerging in GIS. And so that included uh, DH, digital humanities, uh, education, public health, business, um, health sciences in general. So uh, this was quite interesting as well to see and uh, the, the multitudes of, uh, of disciplines that are also using GIS to support a variety of projects. So next slide, please. We can also see that 75% uh, of the community reported the using the GeoPortal often to very often to support users. 88% uh, use it to support instruction and 56% reported uh, faculty at their institutions using it for instructions as well. Next slide, please. And this is a, a bit of a, we, we pulled out a few of the quotes from the researcher survey, some of the ones that we thought were, uh, were really interesting. Generally, we had really positive feedback from that survey. Um, I'm not gonna read them all because it's you know in the interest of time, but it gives you a sense of how researchers feel about it and uh, continuing to have access to it. And, the, the primary functions. So next slide, please. Uh, so our SWOT analysis uh, revealed that uh, we looked at some alternatives such as Jew Blacklight and some out of the box solutions, but none could really serve as a viable replacement. Uh, we did discover one that could be used as middleware, which we are recommending. Uh, our meetings with Esri also helped us have a better sense of the potential of the out of the box solutions. Um, as well as, uh, as that middleware option. And uh, we integrated this feedback into our functional requirements document and business case report. Next slide. And so uh, we, the road ahead, uh, we're, we'll, we're looking at it with the eye towards sustainability, uh, using technology that will ideally last us for another 10 years, um, looking to have a cleaner, more user-friendly interface leveraging open APIs and more integration with platforms such as ArcGIS Online and having custom download and access to large volumes of data because data is always getting bigger and uh, support for projects like the historical maps, air photos, index navigation and batch processing and also uh, having access to more tools to track the usage and stats to help improve the platform to respond to uh, evolving needs in the future. Next slide, please. And that's it. So uh, I, we also wanted to make sure that we, we emphasize that this was a, a group work that uh, from, from a lot of dedicated uh, team members. So we'd like to also thank Marcel, uh, Dan, Am Amber, Leanne, Marcus, and Kate for all their work and dedication to the project and helping draft these recommendations. And we, of course, would love to hear from you. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat or, um, or email us, and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee and Kara. That that was a lot of work. I know that um, it, it's been a lot over the years since we're really looking forward to 
moving forward and having um, a new sort of vision for the geo portal. So in that um, sort of theme of things, let's move it on over. Um, we're gonna be talking with Alexander Cooper from Queens University. Alex is gonna be talking about future directions for Odyssey. Thanks, Amber. Um, well, hold on, I just gotta share, start my PowerPoint and share the right screen. There we go. No worries. Take your time. Let's there we go. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, um, and continuing effort, um, we're always trying to improve data access um, for everybody. So, in a continuing effort to improve data access and discovery, <clears throat> the Ontario data community with Scholars Portal have started to a project to migrate Odyssey from the current Nestar platform into Dataverse. And I'll speak a bit more about this later um, shortly, but first a brief history of data access services in Canada and how we got to where we are today. Um, I'd like to reinforce that this is a very brief for 60 years of history down into about four minutes. So if anything is wrong or you notice any date errors, um, I'm just trying to compact a lot of history here. So, <clears throat> Uh, the first machine readable census data was released for the 1961 census and users would have to have uh, an expertise in statistical software and access to international institutional computing centers to use the data. Uh, so there are very little access or easy access to this to the data. So from this point, um, we start to see the need for and the evolution of data services and data portals. The first Canadian data library was established in 1972 when the UBC Computer Center's data service merged with the university's library. And in 1980, the University of Toronto data library was established. Since then, data librarians and specialists have been working to provide their users with the best access to data files. Early on, each school would work independently to find access, uh, find and access data files needed by their researchers. But as the internet and computing infrastructure develop, schools were able to provide data access portals, and we start to see a growing partnership and collaborations develop to better provide uh, access to data and improvements in the stewardship of data. One of the first consortiums created in Canada for accessing data was, from, was uh, for the 1986 census. Statistics Canada announced a new cost recovery model where the cost of the data files would be significantly higher than the previous 1981 census. In response to this, CARL, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, um, created a consortium of its members to purchase one copy of the data and share it among all the schools. During the 90s, the library, library data services started developing their own access portals for data. These portals were usually homegrown programs that allowed researchers to access and download data at their institution. There, <clears throat> there was a variety in what these services provided. Some allowed for creating cross tabulations and running statistical tests in addition to downloading data and documentation, while other, others only provided search and download features. Some of the services like QIFS here at Queens and IDLS at Western provided subscriptions allowing researchers at other institutions to use their local data portals. An important step forward in institutional coll collaboration was in 1996, when the Data Liberation Initiative, a partnership of Statistics Canada and Canadian universities and colleges was introduced to making access to StatsCan data simpler and providing training for data librarians and specialists across the country. As we move into the 2000s, we start to see the beginnings of more collaboration and sharing of the workload. With the development of the Nestar platform by the Norwegian Centre for Research Data, researchers can easily search for, find, manipulate, and download data. In 2008, Scholars Portal introduced Odyssey, which is built on the Nestor, Nestar platform. Um, and so now all Opal schools have uh, easier access to Statistics Canada data and public opinion, do a public, public opinion polling data. 
also using Nastar <clears throat> as a platform is the Abacus Data Network, a partnership of UBC, Simon Fraser University, University of Northern British Columbia, and the University of Victoria. At the same time, Western University and Craypook, which is a consortium of Quebec universities, merged their systems to create Equinox, a bilingual data access platform. As these collaborations grow and expand, in institutions start to see a wide, wider audience needing access to more different types of data. This audience is no longer limited to researchers who are experts in statistics, but now include other faculty researchers, grad students, and undergrads. To further support, uh, support their users, Scholars Portal introduced the GeoPortal, which provides access to geospatial data, and Dataverse, which pr uh, provides a place for researchers to publish their data. They also open Odyssey and Dataverse to non-Ogle schools, and um, Scholars Portal developing these services meant that institutions can now focus on providing support and training to the users and expanding the use of data into fields of study that are not traditionally known for using data. As the Nestar platform nears its end of life, Scholars Portal and the Ontario data community are working on migrating Nestar and data and documentation to an Odyssey Dataverse collection. As a pilot, we're currently working on migrating the Canadian Opinion Research Archive collection of public opinion polls to Dataverse, and that should be released in the next few months. And then later this year, um, or actually we just had our first meeting last week, so we're just now starting um, to work on migrating, uh, planning for the migration of the rest of the Odyssey collection. So now <clears throat> on to the Odyssey migration and how this will help support future curation, curation and discovery of data, statistics, and researcher data. Since 2008, Odyssey has had a shared infrastructure for access to social science data, collections, and public opinion polls. Its online search allows for exploration and download of data in a variety of statistical formats and provides DDI variable level metadata support for question and concept level discovery. Nestar is the backend repository for Odyssey and it is reaching its end of life and will be decommissioned in 2023-24. The Nestar Replacement Working Group did an evaluation of potential replacement solutions uh, starting back last fall, looking for different models and workflows. We presented a report to Opal SPOD in March 2022, and Dataverse was selected as the replacement solution. The Odyssey search page, um, we're going to maintain and um, keep running to help facilitate search and discovery of not only Odyssey data collections, but also collections and researcher data already deposited in Dataverse. The centralization of these data also allows for coordination of collections across institutional data versus the linking of similar data sets like the um, various different various uh, public opinion polls collections that already exist in Odyssey and in Dataverse and the collection, sorry, and the discovery of more data by users. This image shows the distributed model of collections using the Odyssey search. Users can do a search and the results will be pulled from a variety of collections, such as institutional dataverses, uh, collaborative research projects, the Odyssey collection, and any other collection contained within the Dataverse national infrastructure. The model also provides storage, backup, and preservation of everything in Dataverse. As an example, in the current Odyssey search um, attached to the Nestar server, doing a search on COVID brings in results from Statistics Canada's COVID data sets. With the migration, a search on COVID not only will result in the Statistics Canada data sets, but also data sets from re uh, institutional researchers, Health Canada, public opinion polls, and anything else that's been deposited in Dataverse. So our next steps, um, we are working with Scholars Portal, the working group is working with Scholars Portal to automate the workflows and migration based on the results of the testing with the Canadian Opinion Research Archive migration. The working group is also working on adapting uh, standard metadata and creating con controlled vocabularies 
for use in marking up data sets um, and creating documentation and training models for data librarians and specialists, but also dataverse users. And Scholars Portal will be working on integration of the Odyssey search site and evaluating the publishing and loading workflows for maintenance and for new collections. Both the working group and Scholars Portal will continue to consult and communicate with stakeholders and communities about the changes and the migration timeline. So this is a list of the current migration project working group. And um, that's my presentation. If you have any questions about this, you can contact myself or Amber Leahy or um, anyone from the migration, um, migration working group on the slide, the previous slide. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alex. It was so nice to see that timeline of the history of these data access platforms in libraries. If you have any questions at this point, you can put them in the chat um, or raise your hand and we'd be happy to take them. While you're thinking, I have some, uh, some other updates. So, you know, just, just so you know, in, in March 2022, Odyssey had over 140,000 page views and nearly 5,000 data set downloads. So that's exciting. <laughs> And then um, I can't forget Dataverse, so I wanted to let you all know, in case you hadn't already heard, that in January 2022, we upgraded Dataverse to version 5.8.1 with new features for file embargoes, anonymous review, and improved identification of data formats, and a previewer for geospatial data. Great, well, thank you so much. We'll just give it one more minute if there are any questions. Oh, well, there's a question from Sarah Rutley about, I think this one's about Odyssey. Will the new Odyssey infrastructure include something similar to the current browse file directory interface? Ooh, that, that's a good one. We talked about that. I know a lot of users appreciate being able to discover data in that way. It makes sense to have that available. Absolutely, Sarah, um, we are envisioning repurposing those Odyssey categories in our Dataverse metadata. And um, Alex has been working very closely with uh, the Scholars Portal team here, Caitlin Newson and Victoria Lubitsch, who's, who's helping us sort of craft that migration and repurpose those topics. And we actually believe that we can recreate that browse file directory on the Odyssey search site by um, harvesting metadata from Dataverse. Yeah, and part of the, um, one of the things we're working on, I mentioned about controlled vocabularies, um, that's part of what's gonna make that kind of work better. So we're really um, focusing on controlled vocabularies for geography, topic classification, the keywords, so that when you do a search, you can easily faucet, facet down to the geography you're looking for, or the topic or um, survey you're looking for. Great, and actually this one is directly for you, for you folks at Queens. Is Queens doing a data day again? From Lisa Bouchard at RMC. Um, I can answer that. Uh, Megan's already put a note in the, um, the chat as well, but as part of the Data Champions project um, that, um, Queens is participating in, we do have a data day as part of um, one of our events that will most likely take place in 2023. So giving us a little bit of time to prepare for that, but yeah, stay tuned. That's definitely something we would like to offer again. Great, thank you for that. And then Sarah Tume from RMC has a question about controlled vocabularies and, um, and being indigenized. And, and I think that if I can, you know, comment a little bit on that, we we are planning to use our exist sort of our existing controlled vocabularies in terms of subject topics, uh, which do come from sort of I think I believe at one point it was Statistics Canada, um, and they were derived initially from an OECD data catalog project. Um, so so we haven't quite discussed ways in which we can um, support indigenous 
uh, reconciliation or, or thinking through ways that we can, uh, you know, improve those controlled vocabularies. Uh, but I, I'd love to hear more if you have some ideas around that. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, great. Well, if you don't have any more questions, I'll just uh, thank again so much to Megan and Alicia for talking us through Cortress Seal certification for the Dataverse repository at Queen's University. Um, and thank you so much again to Kara Handren and Renee Duplan for talking about the Scholars Geoportal Infrastructure Renewal Project and the value that the Scholars Geoportal brings to local institutions. And uh, to Alex Cooper from Queen's University for taking us through that whirlwind history of data access to um, Statistics Canada data and Social Science Survey data in Canada. It was really um, interesting and I hope that the direction um, continues to be embedded in libraries for that data. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Amber. Uh, so we are almost at the end of our two day journey. <laughs> um, we are now going to move for some closing remarks uh, to uh, Karen Pilon, who is the co-chair of the OCL SP committee. If she is here. I'm here, I'm just taking off my mute button. Yes, 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 sorry, sorry. Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be part of this amazing day. And so, you know, this has been an incredible uh, scholars portal, two scholar portal days. And I'm so proud of the work that we are doing. Je suis tellement fière de tout le travail qu'on a fait ensemble. And as I think of our theme, Currents of Change, I just like to reflect on the word current. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. This includes Les Détroits, the Straits of Detroit. And I, was, I reflect on the river of the land and the land. I think about those who have come before me. You know, those who have been on this land, who have toiled, who have hunted, who have built homes, who have created relationships, and those who have worked and studied here at this University of Windsor. And so it was actually in this building that I met the powerhouses, Gwen Ebbett and Cynthia Archer, my first understanding of what a library leader looks like since Gwen hired me as a librarian in 1999. To hear Leslie Weir talk about the key players for the National Site Licensing Project was incredible. And to know that these two key players were my mentors, wow. And then as a fun side note that this project started on August 18th, my birthday, I thought, wow, lots of great things are born on this date, but I digress. So this day would not have been possible without the tremendous work of the Scholars Portal Day Committee, which includes Sabina Pagato, Ed Drieger, my uh, co-chair, our co-chair for uh, Scholars Portal, Allison Hitchens, Anika Ervin Ward, Amy Greenberg, and Bart Kawula. And with the tremendous support from the SPOD team and all others who work tirelessly at Scholars Portal. So I go back to Leslie's words, from cooperation to collaboration, to put forth a compelling vision, to recognize how our past was full of radical thinking and ideas, and some of them presented in the last two days, and that we're a product of all that vision and all that collaboration, and we continue to push these ideas continuously. And this is what makes Scholars Portal so great. And we've understood, and we continue to stride in making access to information in whatever form, whatever medium, whatever topic, becomes to become available in our institutions across Ontario. And so we thank you so much for being with us today. We are truly stronger together. This is what I've learned by all of this. And uh, I wish you a good path forward and let us continue to work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. That was really beautiful. And um, I just wanted to echo Karen's thanks to everyone. Uh, many thanks to our speakers, 
our session moderators today, uh, all my fellow members of the planning team, uh, the folks at, at Scholars Portal and the OCAL office staff who've, you know, been helping out on Zoom and otherwise to make this, this event uh, a success. I'm just going to drop a link in the chat to our feedback form. If you could take a moment to fill that out, um, that would be uh, excellent. Um, we want to make sure that all of our Scholars Portal days are um, as excellent as possible. So we'd like to know what you liked to what you uh, maybe wish was a little different so that we can improve Scholars Portal Day's future. And you know what, despite the fact that as per tradition, our Scholars Portal update ran long, it happens every single year and every single year I make a plan for how we're going to handle it. And I guess my plan this year was successful because we are eight minutes early and I am going to declare Scholars Portal Days 2022 closed. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I hope you all have a great day and uh, we will be distributing the recordings next week. Thank you, Sabina. I just thank wanted you, to Sabina. quickly pop on and and uh, want everyone who's still here to give Sabina a virtual round of applause because as usual, we would not be able to have this event um, without her. It was a group effort, but Sabina was definitely the leader of the group. So thank you everyone for your participation and attendance and shout out to Sabina and everyone from SP and Ockel who contributed. Thank you all.